Hey everyone, welcome to Know Your Gear podcast episode 304. <laughs> I hope everyone's doing well, can hear me well, see me okay, all of that stuff. And uh, so anyways, I hope everybody had a good week. I'm just looking to see how everything's going so far. So good. Hello all. Hello. Yep. Okay. And let's refresh that. Okay. So uh let's uh let's uh how was everybody's week i hope it was good mine was good too and um we have a lot of stuff to talk about a lot of questions already early risers coming in as always i just want to point out a few things if you see somebody's name in blue with the blue wrench that means they're a moderator they're here to help uh maybe facilitate a question give you guys some information especially sometimes you know just stuff throughout the show and uh they're just awesome people and i want to thank them every week for for basically making this possible uh, the next thing you're going to see is people in green. People in green are just members of the channel. That just means they're supporting just like patrons. We have patrons and YouTube members. And that was interesting enough. That was a question that came in on, which is a segue to uh, what I'm going to announce every week for a little while, which is we have the www.knowyourgearpodcast website right here uh, where you can see the latest episode. This is it. Currently, you'd be watching this one. And of course, see the back episodes and uh, also be able to catch it on all the other platforms. Also follow us on the, all the social media tabs right there. And uh, if you want to review, you can request that. And of course, if you want to be a sponsor of this podcast, we are supported by members and patron members, and you can become either. And so that's basically, we just wanted a one-stop resource for you guys so that we didn't have to deal with, hey, how do I know when the show is or how do I see old shows? You just go right to www.knowyourgearpodcast.com. Um, but the question was, is it more beneficial to us to be a channel member on YouTube side or patron? There's really not a benefit either way to us that's different from each other. The main difference is on Patreon, you can go to higher tiers if you want to do the 10 or $25 tiers. There's higher tiers and you get more things if you're interested in that. And they're back all open again. We had them shut down because we couldn't get merch and we just restructured everything. And, and so there's just other benefits now until the merch thing is solidified, which is getting, getting better, I think. Actually, I don't think this is the new merch shirt, but this is the old shirt. <laughs> But uh, it's it's getting done. And so anyways, um, so that's all that stuff. I feel like that's all the stuff, you know, the hey, like, subscribe, become a member, all that crap you got to say uh, to to make a living on these platforms. We did it. <laughs> uh, uh, Unfreaking believable says, Phil, you painted the room. It's a trick, man. I've been tricking people for years with this stuff. Um, it's the lighting. There's no lighting today. So sometimes what makes the walls look blue or different colors or whatever, it's a lot of lighting trickery. Um, there's no lighting. Today's soft lighting. We went with, I went with the classic look. Last week was all 80s. I went 80s metal, <laughs> put all the 80s guitar. The best comment was somebody said, uh, it's okay to invite one weirdo to the party, but not all the weirdos to the party. He was saying there was just too many uh, glam 80s rock guitars. This is all more chilled, you know, kind of chilled tone guitars, right? And... Uh, so I decided to change the lighting accordingly. That's uh, that's my prerogative. Try to keep it interesting, something visual for you guys to look at. I know it's I know it's not my shirts and sh black hat and shirt you see every week. <laughs> There's nothing interesting about that. But at least this, uh, you know, could make the what you have to watch if you're watching this. Uh, at least you could see like, oh, what's up this week? What's behind him? Why? So there you go. Um, so let's see. Um, by the way, Johnny, thank you so much. He says, uh, hey, dig my Friday with all of you. Thanks uh, for the platform, Phil. You know what? Thank you guys for hanging out every week. It's pretty cool. It's a pretty cool thing, man. Um, it's one of those things, like sometimes I tell myself and others I don't really get this, and then I kind of watch later. I'll watch the back end of the episode when I'm indexing all the stuff, and I'll go, you know what? It's pretty, it is pretty cool. It's a pretty cool environment. So uh, what do we have to talk about? I have some questions that came in. That's why back to the www.knowyourgearpodcast.com. That's also you can submit questions throughout the week if you want to see them get featured on the shows. Or like I said, they turn into videos uh, because those are questions. Like I said, it's not a guarantee that you'll be on any of these things. There's just, you know, not everything is the most interesting question in the world or it will pertain to everybody. But sometimes, like I said, if it just piques my interest, I want to I want to share with you guys. So, like I said, I appreciate you guys doing that. That's actually my way of saying, please understand. I wanna, I wanna do as much as I can. So don't take it, don't take it in any kind of negative way if it doesn't get featured, or hold your horses and wait because sometimes 
Uh, I will tell you what happens to me sometimes is kind of funny. Sometimes we'll send me, somebody will send me an email thing saying, thanks a lot for like doing my question. And I'll be like, oh, you weren't paying attention. We did it last week. Finally, I know it was a month, but it finally came through. So, and then they apologize. <laughs> Uh, oh, Michael. Okay. Michael says, is that a new SG in black? I broke a rule today. Um, mostly cause I was in a hurry. <laughs> I decided to go to lunch with my son and my wife and, um, it was a nice lunch and, uh, you know, it kind of breaks the day up, which is nice, but then it kind of puts me in a different mindset for getting stuff done. So what I mean by that is the black SG. What is that? That is an exact, exact, I'm not exaggerating, exact clone of my burst SG. Uh, there's a video, so if you guys don't know what I'm talking about, I have a burst colored uh, SG, and um, it's been in a ton of videos, and it has its own video a review when I bought it. I bought it like four years ago or three years ago. It was quite a while, it was pre-COVID, so pre-COVID guitar. Um, what I mean by exact, I mean that is the exact same guitar, that black SG is the exact same guitar, same neck, same pickups, same everything in every way. And it's because I like that SG so much that I bought a bunch of SGs, not like, don't get carried away. It wasn't like 10, but it was like, you know, one and then another one trying to find the one that was exactly like it. And these two are almost indistinguishable in how they feel and sound. Uh, they are super consistent. And so why is this? Because I, because I don't like sometimes to have to come into this, uh, you know, this is where I work and I love my job, but Sometimes if I come in here for my personal time, uh, I find myself working again. So I like to stay out of here sometimes. And that means I have a, another place to play. And I wanted that SG in that other room, but I, I, I need it for um, the same reason I had uh, forever my uh, Copper Strat and now, of course, the Copper Delos. There's another reason why those guitars are important to me. When I'm trying an amp, let's say a company sends a product. I, I think I've talked about this, but it was a long time ago, so maybe it's worth it again. When a company sends a product to review, one of the things that I, I really find paramount that I do, and especially if you guys are doing YouTube channels and maybe starting YouTube channels and doing gear reviews too, it's just something to think about. One of the things that I find paramount is that the new product be the only thing you're unfamiliar with. So in other words, like if I'm trying a new amp, I want to make sure the guitar that I'm playing, I know this guitar in and out. I know how it sounds through every amp it's ever played through. I know how it feels. I know how it reacts to everything. If I cable, I'm using the same cable, same pick. Like in other words, I want to know what that product, that amp is doing that is different. And I don't want it to be like, oh, I didn't think about the fact that I was different, you know, using a different guitar. So I tend to want the same guitar for that kind of stuff or the same, you know, pedal or amp if I'm, you know, doing a guitar. So that's my clone SG <laughs> and it's, I've had it for a quite a while. Um, not like years, but a quite a while. And I just never had it in this room. So it's in here today because I saw it and I go, I should, oh yeah. I didn't think anyone would see it or think of it. So the good, good, uh, no, <laughs> I should never underestimate us gear freaks and, and our, uh, our perceptions and, and what we, what we see. Um, uh, Sean Brooks says, Hey, Phil, what is the closest PRS SG? It's the Mira to, in my opinion, the Mira is an SG. It's, it's, it's a very SG esque guitar. Um, one of the things about Gibson SGs, uh, that is tough for me is that there's not a whole lot of guitar companies that make an SG style guitar. Obviously ESP makes the Viper, but it's hard to find a Viper that vibes like the SGs that I like here. Like, you know, you find a Viper and I'll pick it up and it plays great. The neck is great. It, it feels great, but it's EMGs and it's a different vibe, you know, different kind of feel tone wise for your ears. And so, you know, and I, but an ESP Viper L LTD Viper is a close thing to an SG. In my opinion, the PRS Mira is definitely very SG, um, uh, in my opinion, right. It's going to have the same vibe. Um, the, um, Nags makes a, a guitar that is very SG, but it's like three times the price of an, it's not three times the price of an SG, but it's double the SG minimum, minimum double what a Gibson SG is. And sometimes I have a problem uh, with when Fender and Gibson make a good guitar and then there's another version of it, but it's like twice as much as them. I'm like, they're already kind of pricey. You know, I don't need it to be so, but I, like I said, Nags makes a version of it like as well. So I, uh, I, uh, I had a, an interesting conversation with the heritage guys, uh, and this is going to segue into two things, uh, right now. 
Um, they reached out uh, because we talked about them on the show. And uh, one of the things I mentioned in passive, besides a very, very nice conversation on the on Zoom call with them, um, was I said, hey, you need to make an SG. And they said, yeah, we get that a lot. And I said, you should make one. And they, they went, yeah, I know we should. <laughs> so I go like, okay, I will say no more. We will just assume that maybe you're going to, or maybe we're going to assume you can't. So either way, I don't know what's going on. But uh, why am I talking about that? Um, because I feel like this is worth talking about. Um, where is it? Where is it? Um, <laughs> see, I, I hope and I'm hoping I put it here. Let's see. Did I, I usually, I file all these questions and emails and I have somehow misfiled this. How did I do this wrong? I'm sorry. I should think I should be prepared. I should be better prepared. This I don't know where the the email went. Hold on a second. Now I got you guys probably all like, what? What's going on? Okay, I can't find the email and I absolutely apologize. I have no idea why it's not where I think it should be. I'm gonna double check right now. Okay, so I apologize for not actual reading the actual email to you guys that came in, but I will do my best to to talk about the sentiment that was in it and i i don't know why i filed it i'm checking one more place i filed it so i wouldn't lose it and now i can't find the folder that I apparently i put it under okay so i apologize for that so let me just go one more pass i know i'm gonna start all right. okay let me let me talk about it so what happened was i got an email from the people at lace pickups um, why is that important? It's important, as you know, a couple weeks ago, somebody asked me about lace pickups and I said that I just wasn't a big fan of them, mostly because I didn't have some positive interactions with them. And, uh, you know, I left it as that, you know, like I said, I always, I am a fan of the old lace pickups and I didn't really enjoy my interactions with the companies, uh, with the company and they reached out. So, you know, they reached out, they said, Hey, look, we saw what you said. They said first they're, they're fans of the channel of the podcast. They watched the podcast. And they saw what I'd said and they said, look, uh, we're sorry you, you know, had that experience, but also they said, you know, Hey, just to be upfront, we've had some changes around here. Some, 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 uh, people changes, <laughs> right? Uh, so there, so different people there now. And so the people maybe I had problems with are no longer there. And they didn't say, of course, cause they did the very, uh, smart thing to do a very business-like thing to say like, Hey, look. We're, we're not saying who exactly you probably had problems with, but we're just saying that there's been a regime change and most likely any of the people that you had trouble with uh, are not here anymore. And so that was very, very nice. And so, like I said, I just want to let you guys know that because sometimes, you know, when you say something like that, what I said about a company and they reach out, you know, this is what you you hope for, right? They just said, hey, look, if, uh, you know, if you ever have any questions, let us know. And uh, I just want to let you guys know that's great when a company does that. There's no, no better thing than a company can do in my opinion, to win back a customer than other than saying, than other just, than other than just reach out and say, Hey, we're sorry, you had a bad experience and how, how can we make that better? Right. And so I just want to let you guys know, uh, what it was. And so, you know, since, since there was a regime change, and I tell you, I've said this before on the show, one of the things that I, I try to stay in tune with, which is hard, is that sometimes you don't have a problem with a company. You do have problems with people and, like I said, sometimes those people are, are, they change in this industry. Like I said, I like some people in this industry so much that they've jumped companies and I follow different companies with them because I like them. And there's some people in this industry I don't care for, right? Or can't get along with, it happens. And they jump companies and then the company I didn't work with, now I work with because they're not there or something like that. Now, I in the, in the, uh, the importance of this is, uh, just so I be very clear, when I said I did, had a problem with the people at lace there was it was a particular person and just so you know had nothing to do with me <laughs> so i want to be i want to be very upfront about that because i was being vague and i want to be more uh transparent about what happened uh in this somewhat details what happened was they never actually did anything bad to me at all so you know um they never said anything negative or did anything wrong what happened was they were very in my opinion inappropriate and rude, unprofessional, and even this person, um, and even 
that's enough. Rude, unprofessional, you know, unkind. Just they were just a crappy person to another YouTube channel that was a lot smaller. And what happened was the I ha I was this channel reached out to me as like, hey, you know, like as you do, as you do in this, uh, you know, in the world, you reach out to somebody who says, hey, you're, you know, you've been around a little longer. You may, you, you have a little bit bigger channel. How do I handle this? And I told them that you, there's no, there was no excuse for the way they were treated. And what was interesting was um, about a month later, I happened to be at the Summer Nam show and that same person that treated that channel horrible, basically walked up to me and said, hey, I'm a fan of your channel. <laughs> and I wasn't, I, I said, yeah, I don't want to talk to you. And it was because, you know, the old saying, right? The person who's crappy to the waitress or waiter, but nice to you is not a good person. That's how I took that. You know, if you're only going to be nice to me because my channel is somehow bigger or big enough, you know, um, you know, as someone who's, who's been on that side of the fence of when your channel's smaller and still to this day, I have to deal with it when your channel's smaller than what a company perceives as being valuable, they sometimes are rude, you know, condescending and that's fine. Some, not fine, but you don't understand. You can, you know, take your lumps, but sometimes it's just really ridiculous. And it really rubbed me the wrong way that this person was like dismissive. Um, by the way, the other thing is, cause I, I can't tell you the details of the channel cause that would be their business. And if you guys want, I'll reach out to them and ask them if they're okay with me telling the story. But the thing that really pissed me off in their story was it was your channel. They basically told them your channel's not that big. You're not that valuable. We're not going to, you know, I don't want to work with you. But then they asked that channel for a favor because they knew that that channel knew another guitar company and asked them for a favor. And they said, should I do this favor for them? And I said, no, <laughs> no. What would you, what would you do that for? So that's, I'm just giving you a, a sense of what happened. So I'm just really happy that they, 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 they reached out proving again, what I say all the time that, you know, companies are people and people change. Not only do they change physically. <laughs> they go to become different, go to different places, but they also, um, you know, sometimes they just change per in, in, internally. So that was good. I just wanted to share that experience with you. That was good. So I'm glad they reached out and I'm glad heritage reached out. I think we might have some exciting things coming from heritage. We'll see. We'll see. You know, I find I jinx myself every time I do talk like that, but the conversation I have with them was very positive and, and very helpful. Um, and so, you know, with the lace guys, um, there was no discussion about me doing any videos or anything. They just wanted to let me know, you know, that they had, you know, that they changed and they, sorry, had, had that experience. Also keep in mind, I have all their pickups, so I would really not need anything from them to do videos. So I feel more positive about doing some videos. So if you guys want some lace videos, let me know. I got almost every lace pickup there is. I'm not exaggerating. I have them all. I mean, I, you know, I have like nine out of, you know, 90% of their pickups. I already own them and I could do videos, but I didn't feel like helping a company that was that way. And now they're better. Um, so, and then real quick, just cause we're on this, uh, company topic, uh, Jeremy wants to know, Hey, how's the production on the Badlands guitars? If you go to the Badlands Instagram, they do updates. They show you pictures of where they're at, you know, they're sanding bodies and doing stuff. Um, the production seems to be on schedule. <laughs> um, and right now, I can't tell you for a hundred percent sure, but it looks like we're on schedule for what we promised. We were hoping to be better than what we promised, but I think we're on schedule for what we promised. So that's what we're looking at. But you know, we can always get our hopes up. Maybe, maybe we'll beat that, that timeline we said, but so far so good. It's been pretty exciting. So you'll know a lot more than anybody else because, uh, once uh, my part comes in, I'll have to, I'll be definitely more involved with that part of the production. Um, okay. What else? We got other questions. We should probably do, we, we should do other questions. Okay. Let's, uh, let's do some early riser questions real quick. I grabbed a couple that were interesting. Um, and the... Uh, first one came from Leonardo who wants to know, did I buy the files from AliExpress? We had talked about on this channel, on the podcast about nut files being super expensive and me buying some of the inexpensive ones. Um, I, uh, I had a viewer reach out and say, Hey, here's a set that they were interested in on Amazon. I bought the set that they recommended. 
Um, I have all the information. I am very impressed with the files so far. Um, obviously, I have to make a video of me cutting an entire nut with them. And but I already can tell these files are pretty legit. Here is the problem I'm having. I've even I figured out the exact company that makes them, and I've tried to find like on AliExpress or you know other places where where to get them exactly. Because besides you know, because here's my concern. Um, when I looked, when I bought them, I think there's like 30 in stock on Amazon. <laughs> and the problem is, is once I do the video, you guys will buy them all in five seconds. And then literally those be back ordered. And my biggest concern is that you'll, cause they look like they all look alike, all these. Um, so you guys know it's like a red, a blue and a yellow handle file. But if you go off that alone, I don't think you're going to get the right set of files because I can obviously tell there are different versions of files that look the same. So I'm trying to isolate. I'm trying to get a hold of that company even on that company makes a ton of things, including like toys and furniture and all kinds of stuff. So I'm trying to get a hold of a way so that when I do this video, you guys can actually get these. So you guys have a reference of it. They're about 30 to $40 for this set, which is not cheap, but far, far from the, the, you know, hundred, 200, $300 price points of the other files, but so far so good. I will share with you guys once I have more, uh, more to share. So the good news is that we, we secured a set of files in there so far. Pretty good. That's uh, important. And then that leads me to the Inya video I did this week. Uh, I bought a, uh, a carbon fiber acoustic guitar uh, that's three quarters and I did a video with it. And there was some comments about the shipping on that guitar being $80. And, um, you know, I, I, you know, I, I didn't, <laughs> I don't know what to do. So what I did was I did some research and here's what I think happened. I am not a 100% sure. Cause I have not talked to that company, but I am pretty sure like you know 70 percent sure what happened was um exactly that whoever when i released the video whoever bought them whatever was in stock on amazon sold out but instead of showing sold out i think it immediately flipped over to being shipped from overseas so i think the u.s warehouse had them so i think a bunch of you bought some and got them without the paying the shipping and then immediately after the $80 was added in the shipping fee. So the reason I'm telling you that is, is it goes to my logic says that if you hold out, if you're thinking about it, hold out and wait. And as they replenish the inventory in the US, um, I think that that fee will get removed. So just be aware. Okay. And again, I'm not hundred percent sure I'm 70% sure. So, um, yeah. So I hope that helps. Uh, yeah, Brian says, Phil should be put in charge of the economy. No, you know what? That's not what's going on here. What's going on here is, I've told you guys before, I'm a uh, crack addict. You guys are crack addicts. And so when I get excited about a guitar, you guys are just like me. And, you, you know, uh, it's not me. It's us. We're all the solution and the problem, one and the same. So, um, okay. Um. Oh, Adrian said that's exactly what happened with the ERT order. That would make sense. That's one of the downfalls of when you do videos. And I have no control of what videos do. Like I said, I, I, I you know, you do a video and it gets 10,000 views and you do a video, it does a hundred thousand views. And it's just the luck of that title that you can come up with or the thumbnail or, I don't know, everybody, how, I don't know. Like I said, it's, that's, that's one benefit, uh, to being first <laughs> to, to, to see the videos when they come out, uh, from any of the channels you like if that's something you're concerned about. Okay. Um, the next question was an email question that came in. I know I'm, do I'm still doing early risers, but uh, a question came in. I got a flood of these and it was a really interesting question. And I also don't prepare those questions just like live. So in other words, I earmark them like I do now. So I'm just letting you know, I, I haven't done any research. Okay. Cause I don't, I don't do that. That's not what this show is about. It's more about an open discussion more so than research. I can do a standalone video of research. The question was, did I see, apparently, did I see that Fender opened its first retail music store? Now there's two parts to this. So first let's start there. Fender has opened a retail store that sells Fender merchandise and Fender products and Fender guitars and basses, and it's in Japan. And so the question was, did I see that? What does that mean? You know, obviously Gibson did the Gibson garage. Does this mean this is going to be like a flagship store, like the Gibson garage, or do you think this is like the potentially a chain of stores? What are they up to? First thing I have to, I don't understand. So I just got to start with this. I've always been under the impression that Fender 
Japan is a different company. What I mean different, like a different arm of the company. Um, it runs itself differently. That's the way I always seen it in the past as a Fender dealer is that, you know, as a Fender dealer, you couldn't get, as a Fender, I was a Fender dealer for a decade. And so, and, and like I said, custom shop, every line, premium dealer. dealer. So I've, I've, when it comes to Fender and a dealer, my being a dealer has been outdated because I haven't been a dealer for many years, but I was a dealer for a decade. So I can tell you what information is probably still relevant. Fender would have all kinds of product in Japan. We would have no access to them. It was like, it was held separate. It wasn't held, uh, Fender Japan and Fender US seem to run, in my opinion, independently of each other, uh, as sometimes companies do, right? Sometimes it's the same company, like the parent FMIC probably owns it all, but it's ran differently, or maybe it could be, you know, held separate as a company. So first thing, first thing is the, the Fender music store could be um, separate. It could be a, a Fender Japan thing. And yeah, Fender US would know about it, of course, but maybe they weren't behind it or maybe they're not involved in it. That's a very possible thing. The reason I asked this is, or the reason I talk about this is because one of the questions that the question was, did I hear about the store? And the second thing is, what does this mean for the Fender dealers? And the first thing is, it may not mean anything because this may be just a, a Fender Japan thing, right? So Fender Japan, uh, distribution in Japan might just have opened the store because they buy Fender US product, move it in, uh, which is made Mexico stuff as well, and want to load it in the store and sell it direct. Maybe it's about them and their segue around their dealerships. It could be a possible thing. Now, also the, the second part of this question was, could this be the sign of maybe Fender stores coming to the US? Well, of course. I, I mean, and when I say of course, of course, what I mean by that is, sure, if that store kicks ass, I why wouldn't you know, Fender USA go, Hey, maybe we should open stores. Right. Um, there's no, there is no, uh, confusion over what's going on in the market right now. The market is selling direct has a lot of appeal. The first thing about selling direct is you gotta understand selling direct immediately, immediately adds a 30% profit to your products minimum. And why I mean, what I mean by that is obviously if a Fender can sell to a dealer, a product, and then that is marked up to us, the consumer, when Fender sells a direct, they get to keep that margin, even if they have more costs, you know, with shipping and customer service, phone calls and stuff, the costs are a fraction of what the dealerships are getting in. Uh, well, and here's a perfect example of that look at Amazon, Amazon's going to charge about 15% to sell on Amazon, maybe 20% uh, on the high end. And again, a far less than what a, a, an actual dealer would require as a margin to sustain itself. So of course, that's the appeal of that. I like to point out that I'm not advocating for anything. Remember, I'm still, uh, obviously, as someone who's had to sweat it out for a, as a small dealer, I, I still, my heart is always with the small dealers, right? Um, I have no love for the corporations. I'm sorry. You know, I don't, I don't think I have to say sorry for that. I don't think anybody has love for corporations, but it's, it's just more about the, the industry and what it's probably going to do. So, um, so I, I can see it kind of happening in the U S but I also don't, wouldn't understand the logic to it. Um, there's a lot of businesses right now seeing the advantage of not having a physical store. I mean, stores have, you know, the cost of the rent, uh, the cost of, of the build out, the cost of the employees. There's a lot of costs and, uh, those costs continually go up rents go up the rents never stagnate or go down. Uh, they just go up. So these are all costs that once they come in, they're just going to keep going up. So there's a real drive to sell online. So I would say Fender would probably be more interested in selling direct to consumer. The one thing about Fender that I've, I've been very open about for these, all these years is Fender is one of those companies, they play in these little test games where they do this stuff or they sell direct, but they never seem to put enough muscle behind it. You know, um, that's the big thing. You know, if you want to handle customers, you have to be ready for customers. Customers are not an easy thing to deal with. <laughs> okay. So the fact that you're selling direct, they probably have no real clue of what the dealers have been doing. Uh, and do continue to do for them for years. Uh, exactly. If you want to watch, I did a video where I bought a fender from fender and I bought a fender from Sweetwater and it showed the differences that Sweetwater taking some time with the guitar got me, it netted me a better instrument, even though I paid the same price. Um, that's one of those things you're going to see from, you know, from, from fender selling direct. So the, do I think the store, it, the fender store is a sign of the coffin nail for them to kind of get rid of their small businesses or their mom and pops? N 
you know what? I don't think Fender's actively trying to destroy their small mom and pops. I think Fender is actively trying to create plan B. <laughs> right? What happens when they shrink? They will shrink. I've said this before. I don't believe small business music stores are an absolute zero game. In other words, it will go to zero. It's not like blockbuster video where there's only one left in the world. I don't think it's going to go to that. What's going to happen is I've said this before, uh, and anyone who has a small business, you know, if it's worth listening to me, listen to this. Um, if you don't figure out how you fit in this new guitar market, you're not gonna. I say that not as a guy sitting here on a podcast or on a YouTube channel. I sit, sit here as a person who's selling hundreds of millions of dollars worth of guitar product on the internet. That's not, a, I'm not exaggerating those numbers. Those are the numbers. I have, I have hundreds of millions of views on this channel alone. I'm one little YouTube channel, guitar channel. You, I see the, I see the metrics of what's going on. I see the affiliate links. I see what's going, you know, what's, what's moving, what product's moving and how it's moving. And you have to be, you have to be aware that things are changing. It doesn't mean no one goes to stores anymore. That, that's not what it means, but it means you have to have reasons for people to go to stores. And it sure isn't because you have a red or blue Squire Strat. So um, if your plan in, sm in your small business store, if your plan is to rely on Fender and Gibson and those companies, uh, you should have a better plan. They're going to have a better plan. So, you know, they're planning around you. You should plan around them. I'm not saying stop carrying them. I'm just saying have that plan ready too. Um, there's a reason why I go to small stores. Look, there's a reason why all of you, you're all guitar freaks. You're no different than me. All you guitar freaks right now, you go and visit your, your loved ones in another city or state. I would bet right now, and you can put in the comments right now and confirm this. How many of you, when you go to a different city or state, the first thing you do is go look at the local Craigslist or you hit the guitar center's website and look at the local used gear. And you, you know, how many times are now, you now, I used to, whenever I would go visit any family or relatives in a different city or state, I would go to check out the local stores, obviously, but more importantly, I check out the local GC, the guitar centers. Now I just go on their website, that store's website and look at their used inventory online. And if it looks interesting, I'll go. So that just tells you how the market's changed because we're all doing that. So, um, the... Hold on, I'm grabbing this, grabbing another question for, so I can pin it for later. Okay, um, so so that's like I said, that's what has to that's what has to change, is you just have to be, uh, you have to adapt, and there's a lot of there's a lot of stores I think are doing very well adapting. Heck, if you're a small business, if you for my two cents, I'm not telling this to you viewers. Don't disclose your ears. You don't have this. This is for all the small stores that watch the channel. Um, don't worry about Fender and Gibson. Worry about Sweetwater. They're taking over. <laughs> uh, that laugh, that awkward laugh I do, that is me not laughing. Ha ha ha. That's me. Like it's, I, I, trust me, they are, they are the Amazon of our guitar world. And you we used to worry about Guitar Center. And I know people talk about Guitar Center because that's in this, uh, these threads either. I, I got a comment. What did I think about Guitar Center's uh, rating? Get, they got rated uh, again. Their, their Moody's changed their rating to junk bond status. Guitar Center is not a problem for the small music store, so that's why we don't talk about them anymore, okay? Um, Guitar Center's got to worry about Sweetwater <laughs> and the internet, and so does everybody else. Sweetwater and the internet. They are gaining ground at an epic pace, and like I said, um, that's who I would worry about if I, was, if I was a guitar shop right now, is how to live in a world, just like if I was, just like if you are a retailer and you're dealing with Amazon, how do you live in a world with Amazon? That's what you need to think about. How do you, well, yeah, somebody said Tolman. If you're in the UK, insert Tolman where I said Sweetwater. Absolutely, because Tolman's either, Tolman, I think personally is a little bigger than Sweetwater. So, you know, size-wise, there's always arguments about them being the same size, but I me, mean, I've been to both and physically what I've seen from both, Tolman's a slightly bigger company uh, by size and vi volume of dollars, it looks like. Um, so, like I said, if I was a, a guitar store, just focus on how to stay relevant in the market against your Amazon, which right now is Sweetwater. And I wouldn't worry about Fender or Gibson because uh, that's not part of your future strategy, in my opinion. <laughs> Matt says Sweetwater has their own zip code. What's well, that? How? Remember, Sweetwater now has two locations. They have a second one in Arizona, uh, but it's just for it's just a warehouse for fulfilling orders. Um. And then, you know what? And I just want to say this because um, I'm reading some of the comments and stuff. Just to give you a reference, um, 
of this that's interesting is in the last, if just using me for an example, in the last couple of years, I have, um, I bought a few guitars <laughs> and, uh, almost all the guitars that I bought, most of them, the majority of the guitars I bought, I shouldn't say almost all, I'll say 60%, that's fair. 60% of the guitars I purchased in the last, let's say 12 months have been used from independent small dealers. So that is still my interest. It's where can I find a guitar that's obviously a little less expensive than buying new, a little bit more unique because sometimes new is not very unique. In other words, even though you can buy the same guitar new and used, you know, used it's, it's, there's this opportunity there. It's maybe somebody modified something. Maybe somebody did something to it. Maybe like I said, it's a little less money. There's a reason why it really wants you to make that purchase right there. And those are all small dealers like Zim's guitars. Uh, you know, there are all kinds of small dealers. You know, I, I pop in and I'll buy something. Cause like I said, it's an opportunity to buy. I can't wait. It's not like Sweetwater is like, Oh, if I don't buy it now, you know, I guess I'll just do it next week or when it's back in stock, you, know, you walk in a small store and they have a used piece of gear. If you don't buy it, you're probably not going to come across it again. It's not likely. And there's, to me, there's a value to being able to touch a used piece of gear, um, over buying on reverb. So that's, those are the, you know, that's, I, like I said, so small dealers should definitely still focus on used gear and unique things, unique brands that isolate them from other other bigger companies like Guitar Center and Sweetwater. So. Blake wants to know, this ties in, will guitars cease to exist? Will the instrument become irrelevant? Um, I Blake, I love talking about this subject. This is my favorite subject to just jack my jaw and just tell you guys a bunch of crap that's just off my ass just talking, okay? I just want to say this for two things. One, of course, guitars will always exist because they don't go away. <laughs> they last longer than we do. Uh, but I understand what you mean by that. First thing I want to tell you is this. I started playing guitar. We figured this out because we were laughing about the Badlands thing being an 80s brand. And I almost got scared for a second <laughs> because I was talking to my wife. Remember, I've known my wife since I was 13. So I was talking to my wife and I was coming to the conclusion that I actually never played guitar in the 80s. And luckily, she has a better memory than me. And we figured out I have. So I started playing guitar in July of 1989. That was when I got my very first guitar. It was on my birthday in 1989. <laughs> so I did effectively have a guitar in the 80s. Now, um, starting guitar in 1989 in July. Uh, so why is that relevant? Um, this Blake, what I'm gonna tell you was, in 1989, when I started guitar, guitar was dead. In 1989, think about this. Uh, remember, I started guitar. So what comes out in 89? You have Passion and Warfare, Steve Vai. It's one of the biggest selling instrumentals of all time. Um, you had, I think Motley Crue had it. You know, a bunch of rock bands had it. But you got to understand, that's 1989, right? In within no time at all, it was all dead. All that stuff was dead. When I went to high school, I've said this before. When I went to high school, there was a handful of kids playing guitar at my high school. My high school was a big high school. Um, I'd ha I need to ask my wife what the graduating class size was. I want to say it was like a thousand kids had to be right. It was huge. It was a big school. Like I said, it wasn't a small, I wasn't, I'm not from a small town I'm from Tucson. It's Tucson at that time was still, you know, 800,000 people or something like that. It was a big size city, you know, for, for a city. So my point is, uh, I was in a large high school in 1989 and trying to find a couple kids that we're into guitar too, like I was. Like, hey, I've discovered guitar. Are you into guitar too? Like, literally, I would hang out with. There was like seven of us hanging out together. Maybe rounded up to a dozen, and that was tough, right? You, you know. So there wasn't a lot of guitar players at that time. Just a few years earlier, okay, at that same high school, just a few years earlier, there was probably hundreds of guitar players. So why do I tell you that? I tell you this because I tell everybody this. When everybody says, "Hey, is guitar dying?" It's been dying for 30 something years. <laughs> so you know what? It will continue to die for the next hundred. And that means nothing apparently because guitar is still doing great. The overall numbers of people playing guitar are great. The overall numbers of people listening to guitar music is still great. Whether you guys realize it or not, the numbers don't lie. Uh, you know, it's, it's not what it was, but when is it ever what it was? So, um, so there you go. So guitars, is it dying? It's been dying for 30 years that I'm aware of. So, um, 
<laughs> just reading some of you guys' comments. Um, yeah, so like, think about that. Just think about what I just shared with you guys. <laughs> you guys, look at how you guys, this killed rock and roll, that killed rock and roll. Here's why it's what, here's what I think everybody misses. This is my, my opinion on this. Nothing killed rock and roll for a short time that most of us probably weren't even for alive for, right? Some of us were, but most of us weren't. Rock and roll was a pop music uh, phenomena for a short time. And then it's been what it's been for, for pretty much, um, it's been what it's been for decades and decades, which is, there's a reason why we have uh, sm like groups like this, like this is why channels like this aren't, this is why we don't have, I don't have 2 million subscribers and there's not 10,000 of us hanging out. If we, <laughs> right, it's because there's just, it's never been a huge genre. It's just been bigger than blues and jazz. Think of this. We look at rock and roll and metal and go, oh, it's bigger than blues and jazz, but really we're still nothing. We're still the small market. We've always been a small market. So like I said, I'm just happy that I get to enjoy it and people around me, I know <laughs> somebody's like, Polka's dead. Polka might be dead. I don't know. <laughs> All right. We got to go to the next subject. Um, all right. What else? I don't know. Uh, oh, this one came from OE Harvey. He says, Hey, Glary hype. He's talking about Glary guitars. He's like, are Glary guitars hype? Glary guitars are cheap. I have not done a video of a Glary guitar since I think before COVID. So I don't know how much they are now. Remember when I reviewed one, it was $65. And, uh, I don't know if that's hype or not. I reviewed it because it was $65. When somebody tells you they make a guitar for $65, uh, I I got one the same reason you all got one. The ones that got one is uh, just curiosity killed the cat, right? <laughs> like how the hell did you make a $65 guitar? Um, and, uh, and, uh, so yeah, I don't know. It, to me, glare is not hype. They're just the absolute cheapest guitar. Like, I don't know if there's a, is there, let me ask you guys a question. Please put in the comments, not only here, but in the permanent comments, is there a company physically making a guitar cheaper than glare guitars? I mean, does that even exist? I, I don't know why we're curious, but I'm curious. I'm I'm curious about the extremes of everything. Why is a guitar ten thousand dollars? Why is a guitar sixty five dollars? I'm I'm curious. Um, so yeah, let me know. <laughs> yeah, was was uh, uh Susan says sixty five dollar guitar was the shipping eighty dollars? No, you know, do you guys remember when I did the Glary guitars? I uh, reviewed two Glary guitars and then I said I would give them to a charity and I couldn't find any charities that wanted them. But a school teacher said they had an after school program and they wanted them. I gave them to my wife to ship to him and my wife told me that it was cheaper to buy them from Glary and have them shipped to him than ship the ones we had and that's what we did. We shipped. We, we, we ordered new Glary's because it was cheaper in shipping. I could not ship a Glary for as cheap as I could buy a Glary and have it shipped. So that was, uh, that was crazy. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, uh, this is the real Christopher Ryan says, Hey, Phil, which of the two travel guitars would you recommend buying between the journey carbon fiber and the Inya carbon fiber? So I reviewed both those guitars. Um, I really like the journey guys. So, you know, and I, uh, so that's, you know, there's a thing to that. I just, I know those guys, uh, pretty well through the emails and stuff and they were seeming pretty nice. But that being said, I mean, the Inya is the preferred guitar for me. It's not, uh, you know, this one sucks and this one's better. It's just which one I pick. Uh, I'd pick the Inya guitar, not only because the price was better, but I like the guitar. I, like I said, in the end of that video, I did not expect to keep that guitar. Um, sometimes, you know, like these uh, fi files that I bought from Amazon. Look, w when I show you guys then if they work, I'm not going to use them over my expensive files that I've had for the last 15 years, right? Same thing. Sometimes you just buy gear because I have this content to make and I want to illustrate what I learned about it. But it's like, I'm not going <laughs> to, you know what I mean? I'm not going to play this over my my, my guitar that I love that I play every day. But in that Inya guitar, like I said, I could, I can't stop playing it. It's actually right in the, I'm staring at it right now. It's still here. I'm still playing it. Um, in fact, the Inya passed the secret test that no one knows exists, which is when you do a deep dive video, you end up dismantling the guitar and doing so much weird stuff to it and taking the strings off, put it back on all that stuff I got to do for the video that sometimes those guitars, when I'm done, they just sit in pieces in my shop for weeks. <laughs> after I finish editing the video and then somebody's like, what do you think of it? And I'm like, that's oh, actually downstairs still apart. <laughs> um, but I put the Indian tune it back up and everything and been playing it since. 
So, uh, which is not probably going great for the fact that some of you guys are going to have to pay $80 if you try to buy one right now. So like I said, hold off. Um, okay. Uh, uh, this came from SPHNATX says, new guitar day, Fender player, jazz master. I got a set of thorn buckers to put in it. Do I need to change the pots to 500K? I would change the pots to 500K. So that would be my suggestion to you. Um, the thorn buckers are actually pretty bright. You might get away with it with 250K pots because they're on the brighter side of the spectrum in my, to my ears of pickups. But I'm always cautious uh, with humbuckers not to go 250K because they get a little dark sounding and you lose, you know, you're already losing some of the top end sparkle that I like from single coils. And then, you know, the 250K is just going to dampen that a little bit. So I would go 500K. That would be my recommendation to you. Okay, let's, let's, I don't know, let's find the que more questions and subjects. Oh, here it is. My wife made me a cool cup, by the way. I know it's no your good cup, but it's, this is why it's cool. It's for me. Uh, it has, it's a bass. Ta-da, look at that. See, it looks like a guitar, but it's a bass. It's a trick cup. So I'd share that with you guys. I was actually pretty impressed by that. Um, okay, Smell Harder. That's the name here. It says, love your demeanor. <laughs> you make Fridays great. Ah, I appreciate that. That's an interesting name. I like your name. Uh, Mr. S says, happy Friday. Do you think you'll head to NAM this year? No pressure. Have a terrific weekend. Um, you know, I don't want to go. And yet I keep uh, people who I really like keep asking me to go. So um, here's what I'd like to do. Um, I'd like to uh, I'd like to go for the day. So I'm thinking that's what I want to do. Um, I probably should. I probably should go for the day. It would probably good, be a good idea to get out and maybe see some stuff and check out some stuff and do some stuff. I just didn't, you know, it's, it, but I won't be there to work or make videos. It would just be there just to go see people, rub elbows with somebody <laughs> important. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, meet some of you guys if you're hanging out, stuff like that. That So yeah, I'd like to go, but I'd like to go for a day, go for one day. I think it's only two days this year or something like that. I think they cancel Sunday. So I don't know if it's three days or two days, but I'll go for the day. That's my plan. Um, as you guys know, it's, it's only a six hour drive from where I live. So a six hour drive, I'll hop in the truck, I'll drive down there, I'll stay in a hotel and go hang out and, uh, and, uh, maybe see some people that have mentioned that they're going to be there and they would like to see me if I'm there and, May I go have a cup of coffee with him? Uh, so Vim69 says, can't make the show today. Oh, we'll catch it, the replay tomorrow. Cheers to the whole gang. Thank you, Vim69. And uh, as always, is my joke. Uh, this is today for you, but it was yesterday for us. <laughs> you know, I don't even know if I say that the same way every time, but uh, I try. Uh, Luca. Luca says, hey, Phil, greetings from Italy. Uh, I would like to buy a Gibson Les Paul. I love the gold top, but I don't want nitro finish. Any ideas? Thanks for your time. Well, yeah, normally I'd be like, oh, well, there's PRS, but PRS is using nitro finish now. Who's who's not, who's not doing poly, especially in Italy, because Kiesel makes a single cut that's polyurethane. I'm trying to think who else makes a single cut that's polyurethane. I mean, LTD has a single cut that's polyurethane. Um, Heritage is nitrocellulose lacquer. I feel like it's going to come to me. I'm trying to think who makes a Les Paul style single cut. That's Paul, your thing. I mean, Epiphone does. I mean, Epiphone's going to, I mean, I know you're kind of, if you're looking for Gibson, I think you're kind of going for a premium kind of guitar, but Epiphone makes a really good guitar and it's Paul, your thing. So, and that's, you know, change out the pickups. If that's, you know, your, your, your salt to taste kind of preference, but I don't know if necessarily I'm trying to think who else off the top of my head, single cuts. Um, I mean, like I said, I have a PRS hollow body, a semi hollow body that is an S2 that I love that's pre the change and it's a polyurethane finish, but now they're nitro. So, uh, yeah, somebody says a Jack Jackson Monarch. I mean, right. There's going to be, like I said, I hate to say it. It's a Takai. Yeah. I mean, Schechter does. Yeah. Schechter has a Les Paul style guitar, like a solo. That's a Les Paul style guitar. That would be polyurethane. I kind of, I kind of am, I'm kind of thinking, oh yeah, Sire makes a gold top. That's great. But I kind of think when he, cause he said Gibson, I think he wants like a USA made premium guitar. 
um, premium mean premium price, you know, not, not, you know, better than those brands, um, by any means, I'm just saying. So that's what I'm trying to think of. And in the U S I just don't know if you're looking for a USA made single cut guitar. I think there's Kiesel who's polyurethane and there's, I don't know. Maybe Tom Anderson has a single cut and it's polyurethane. That would be a good one as well. So something like that. I don't know. Those are the ones I would, I would start with. And then there's going to be great suggestions in the comments. I'm sure I see everything twice says no question. No question at all. No, he said, no question. Just wanted to say thanks for the excellent space uh, to spend Friday afternoon. Thanks for your advice last week. Hey, no problem. And this is a good time to say thank you guys to you guys. You guys are always thinking me. Let me thank you guys. Um, can I, do I share it? That doesn't matter. doesn't matter if I share. Uh, I don't need a screenshot. Um, we hit 350,000 subscribers. If you look down below, it says, know your gear. 350,000 subscribed people. I want to say that is crazy. <laughs> it is crazy. You know, it's really crazy. Let me tell you what's really crazy and why I'm thanking you guys and why you guys in particular, because right now you're like, yeah, you know, yeah, we didn't do it necessarily, but you did do it. Here's how I know. Um, last week when I said, Hey, I would be really excited if I could hit 350,000 close. I was like 1200 people away <laughs> at my normal rate of product projections of what I normally do. That was at least two, two and a half weeks before I hit that. And you guys nailed it like in seven days, six days, six days. So thank you guys so much. Uh, cause you guys just did it. Cause it just ramped up. We saw it. It was like, and then it was like, I had 350 and I was like, Oh, I'm at 350,000. And, uh, so, and the reason, so you guys know, I just want to be very clear why it matters to me that uh, the subscriber counts, it matters because it doesn't really matter in the real world. It just doesn't. But for some reason, you can't convince companies that it doesn't matter. Companies only focus on that number. And when I talk to companies, I've, one of the things that's most important to me is that we can do the type of content, content that I want to do. And sometimes I have to do that without sponsors. That's fine. And sometimes I do that without any company help. And we do that all the time. But sometimes it's a lot easier and nicer if we have some 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 companies that are working with the channel and they seem to be hyper focused on how big your channel is, which makes sense. But they don't seem to because they don't really this this industry is just very antiquated and old and doesn't seem to understand the, the, the Internet market. Um, what they don't understand is it doesn't matter how many subscribers this channel really has. What matters is who's who the subscribers are. You guys right now hanging out, we hang out for two hours once a week on Fridays. I've explained this to companies a thousand times. I don't think more than maybe two companies I've ever talked to have ever understood this on the level I'm about to explain to you guys, which is real simple. This show averages on YouTube 30 to 40,000 views per episode. It actually averages almost 40,000 views per live two hour episode. And get this, the majority of the people will consume almost the entire show. <laughs> okay. Um, which is crazy. And even if the majority only con consumed half the show an hour, that is far beyond the normal metric of which YouTube usually relies on, which is the 15 minute video, eight minute video system. Why that important, why that's important is you are only here because you are my people. You are guitar nerds. We love guitar. We love guitar. And so obviously it is a huge benefit to companies to be recognized by this community, not me, by you. You are like me <laughs> into guitars. And so your conversion rates are high. In other words, you don't need um, a million views. You don't need a hundred thousand views. Um, uh, you know, think about this. I did a video obviously for the Bandlands guitars. We sold out in three days and uh, that video only hit 16,000 views at that time. 16,000 views sold out, you know, an insane amount of guitars for that price point on a new brand. And so the point is when I try to explain to companies that I don't, what's really valuable here is this audience and the, the relationship that we built and this trust that we built this two way street of, they can talk to me and I can talk to them and, you know, and, uh, they'll crucify me if I don't come, if I don't become transparent, you know, if I stop what I'm doing, which is the transparency thing, obviously you guys would not be too happy and I wouldn't be too happy either. Um, but 
what I found is as much as I try to explain that, I just talk myself in circles and all they really see is your subscri subscriber count. Um, and why that subscriber count matters is it matters for trying to get them to trust the idea. And the idea a lot of times is, hey, look, don't, you know, because every company just kind of really wants a commercial. Hey, just tell them this product's great. And I'm like, that's not what they need. <laughs> it's not what they want. They want, you know, um, it takes it takes a lot for a company to understand that if I said two or three bad things in a video about your product, trust me, these guitar players are more educated than your average guitar player. They don't. The only thing they hear is not the one mistake. They know the overall sum of the guitar, what it is. So, like I said, I, I appreciate you guys subscribing because, like I said, I've learned, I've tried, tried the other way, which is educating the the uh, companies. And really, what I've kind of figured is they go, you know, if you have a bunch of subscribers, they'll listen to you a little bit more. So there you go. All right. Sorry to go on a rant. Uh, <laughs> right. Uh, uh, I'm going to say, I want to say Mike 99 D, but it's really like Mick 99 D M I K Mick 99 D says, Hey, I got, I got you live. I've got you live, but I'm off to bed. <laughs> it's 2311 here. Um, uh, 2300. <laughs> so anyways, I bought an SG E. Oh, I think it's not E. I think that's uh euros, 400 euros. I bought an SG 400 euros pile of crap. Sounded off and awful sold it. Wife bought an Epiphone Les Paul, 10 times better than the Gibson SG. This was 25 years ago. Look, it's not much different now, buddy. Um, I just told you that like, it took me forever to, to find an SG. Well, it took me forever to find an SG I like from Gibson. And then it took me forever to find a second one. Um, and um, so, yeah. No, I, look, I said this. Gibson is kind of the anomaly sometimes when I'm talking about uh, the industry, when I say higher price guitars g generally bring consistency. In other words, you expect a guitar to be at a thousand dollars to be more consistent than a guitar at $300. In other words, if I grabbed a hundred samples of a $300 guitar, I would expect maybe 15% to have issues or 20% to have issues, you know, uh, from my experience looking at guitars, where if I took a thousand, a hundred, I don't know what number I just picked was a thousand or hundred. Let's say a hundred. If I took a hundred thousand uh, dollar guitars, I would expect the number to be half that and maybe only 7% flaws, you know, in the guitars. Um, the exception to that is somehow Epiphone can consistently make more guitars with less flaws than Gibson. That seems to be somewhat true um, in my experience. Um, however, the reason why Gibson gets a pass and I'm not, I'm, 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 I don't mean like a pass from me. I mean a pass from all you, everyone. <laughs> We're all guilty. The Gibson, we're all guilty. And here's why we know we're guilty. They're still one of the biggest guitar companies in the world, if not the biggest, them and Fender, right? And there's a reason why they're big. And the reason why Gibson is big is not because uh, idiots buy G Gibsons even though they're crap, which is what I hear all over the internet. Everybody's got that opinion. You go on every forum and it's like, every time somebody has something negative to say about Gibsons, it's all about Gibsons crap and people who buy them are idiots. And, um, you know, <laughs> let, me, let me put it to you this, this way. Uh, maybe it will make sense. Um, <laughs> wait, hold on. I got a joke. Give me a second. Give me a second. Maybe I don't have a joke. There it is. Um, sorry, I was pulling up. I had this, I had this once I was, uh, I was talking, I pulled this up cause I was actually responding to an email from a patron a week ago about Gibson's and this, and I'm pulled up his email cause I want to read, I want to read what I told him. He was saying basically that um, he wants to buy a Gibson, but when he reads and hears YouTubers talk about Gibson, it's always about how crappy they are. And my response to him was, well, if Gibson's a crap slash plays out of tune and, and he, and he lie or he lies about playing a Gibson, right? In other words, slash is either always playing out of tune or he's lying about playing a Gibson because how could he have a good Gibson? And I told him the answer and here's the answer to all you as well. The truth about Gibson isn't that they make crappy guitars and people are oblivious to it. The truth is, is that Gibson, when they get it right, it's really right. That's the, that's the sad thing. And so when you have someone who really loves their Gibson, it's because it's right. For some reason, when a Gibson guitar, in my opinion, and when a Gibson guitar is right, it's really right. It sings, it plays beautifully. It's just, it's just everything you love about a, a, a hand feeling crafted type instrument or product, you know, something that feels like it's, you know, it feels like it's quality and it feels amazing. And when a Gibson isn't that, it's not. <laughs> all right. And the truth is I've played a lot of Gibsons and you hear it all the time from players all the time that 
you know, they play Gibson and sometimes it's not that great. And sometimes it's, it's magical. And that's my experience too. And it's, somebody says, Hey, so it's a, it's a crap shoot. It is, it is. And that's why when you see somebody who has a Gibson, they like, it's why it never goes anywhere. It stays. They never get rid of it because the odds of finding another one is not impossible. It's just not as easy as guitar companies that make consistency. And I always laugh because some players call consistency no, having no soul. I don't necessarily agree with that. I don't, but I understand the philo I understand that it doesn't feel special because if everyone's got it, how can it be special? If everyone's got a, like if everyone picks up an e a Schecter or an ESP or a PRS and they play the same and they sound the same, if it doesn't feel special, how does it kind of take you to that special place you want to be when you're making music? And I, I get that. I don't, I don't uh, subscribe to that way of logic. To me, it's like if the thing's playing great and it doesn't, to me, it's like, I don't want a guitar that's fighting me back, <laughs> right? I just want to play and I want to enjoy myself. And if it's doing that, it's great. But I think in my opinion, for my opinion is when Gibson is right, it's, it's magical, right? And, uh, and that's my answer to that to that statement about the SG and the Epiphone. So like I said, if you want quality and consistency, I would, and, and Gibson, Gibson, get an Epiphone. And if you want to try and find a magical instrument, try the Gibson. And you also have to be aware of the real costs of a Gibson, which is not just buying a Gibson, it's buying multiples. Think about this. And this is something that please, you can put it comments here, but remember these don't, you know, not only reads these, they read the comments later when the show's uh, permanent, put, please come back and put a comment if you, you know, if you could, what I'm really curious to be is, curious is if you have a Gibson, okay, that you love, right? And seriously, if you have a Gibson right now, if you're watching this, especially the rebroadcast because the bigger pool, or if you're listening to it on the Spotify or iTunes, all that stuff, if you have a Gibson you love, could you please put somewhere in the comments, how many Gibsons before you found the one you love? I feel like it took me six or seven real Gibsons before I found the magic one, right? The first one where I was like, oh, yeah, I think I get this now. This is feels and sounds great. Um, it's hard to get another guitar to sound like this. So that's what I'm curious about because I don't feel like that was a very rare thing for me. I'm not saying you have to try a dozen guitars, but I don't feel like the first Gibson is the best Gibson in most people's play cases. I, can, I think it can be, but I don't think it is. So I'm curious. And that's why I like talking about this stuff. <laughs> because I don't like to talk about like this brand sucks and this brand's good. I feel like that's such a generic way of looking at everything. The reality is if you had to work on as many guitars as I've had to work on, and a lot of you have, because a lot of you guys are a pair of guys watching this, you guys know exactly what I know, which is some guitars just are magical and some aren't. And you really figure that out when the guy, uh, guy behind the counter on the other side of the counter is really pressuring you to make this guitar awesome. He's got a guitar that's not awesome and he wants it to be awesome. And sometimes that's, tough. Somebody says my magic one isn't a Gibson. Well, of course, that just because it's just because I said, I, I have a Gibson that I think is magical. Doesn't mean all, you know, everybody should be playing a Gibson. There's a ton of reasons why you would never want to play a Gibson. I didn't really like Gibsons until I fell in love with like bluesy pentatonic -y stuff. I mean, that's not the stuff I was originally playing. You know, as I get older, I'd like everybody, I tame down a little bit. And as I tame down a little bit, you know, I tend to go more towards the more legacy type guitars. I guess that's what I call them. You know, I guess that's what I'm gonna call them. So, okay. So, like I said, I mean, it's like I said, it's interesting, but, um, but I'm always there interested in hear you guys' thoughts. Uh, Brian says, "Hey Phil, please recommend a nice wrap tail piece for an Epiphone Les Paul special. The stock one isn't uh, isn't slotted, so the strings move literally from." time to time. You know, sadly enough, I don't know if I have a recommendation. Um, I haven't replaced one in quite a while. Um, but maybe that's an opportunity to do a video on that, you know, replacing parts. We, we're already working on a bunch of repair type videos right now. Um, the way we do it, where we're doing it is we're taking all the subject matter you guys are talking about. We're now creating the subjects and then we're creating the actual videos and what they'll be. And then we're going to start like going through them to do them. So in fact, I was actually dealing with that today. Uh, so, so to answer your question, I really don't have a suggestion, but hopefully somebody in the comment section will have something for you. That's the best part about pulling from a 
the hive mind, right? A lot of you guys out there modding up Epiphones. I haven't modded an Epiphone in, in a couple years, like I said. So it's not one I've come across, but maybe, maybe I need to. Maybe I need another sharp my axe on an Epiphone guitar. Uh, Lee says, hey, what do you think of the SG modern guitar in comparison to standard SGs? Um, I like the the modern, all the modern style of Gibsons and the SG modern. I like it in 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 concept. I, I just, that's not what appealed to me uh, for the SG. Like I said, I just happened to find an SG one day. Didn't think much about it. Just wanted one to check a box of, I have a Gibson SG. That's literally all it was. I was like, I want a Gibson SG. And I was doing that thing that sometimes uh, old dudes that have a little extra uh, ch change in the pocket do, which is like, I need a every kind of guitar. Like It's a thing we all go through. Um, I need a SG and a Tele and a Strat and a hollow body, right? For no damn reason, <laughs> right? Because, uh, you know, for my career of doing all this, you know, apparently studio work that you don't do. But uh, so I had it in my head, I need an SG to, to kind of, to check that box and then because i bought it my mentality is like you know once i have something it has i have to use it otherwise it's hard for me to keep it uh because it's hard to have just like you know stuff laying around that i don't use and um and uh, so basically i started playing it and i fell in love so uh so that's what it was for me it wasn't like i specifically went out and said i want the sg standard over the modern or this is the feature set I like. This is just the one I like. And um and that's why, like I said, I, I wanted a second one. I wanted a backup for it. And, and that's what I did. Um I have some other SGs and they're nice too, but uh they're not gonna, you know, probably stay my lifetime. You know, in other words, at some point they'll probably find their way on moving on at some point. Um because you know I've I've kind of I kind of, like I said, I don't, I don't like to have things sit around, <laughs> you know, you know what I mean? It's, it's tough. It's a tough thing to justify. The only time I will let something sit around if I'm not using it is if I really think I might buy it again, because like I've said to you guys many times, that's the lesson I have learned the hardest way. Never sell anything you think you might buy again. You have to ask yourself, you have to tell yourself, right? And, and be honest and think hard because it's important. If you get rid of a piece of gear, you have to commit that you will never buy it again. And, uh, because if you buy it again, that is the most expensive mistake you will continually make with your money. And it's a crappy waste of money. And it just, just on five, it's five levels of stupid. <laughs> and I've done it so many times. Um, I had a video <laughs> still up. I had a video it was one of my first, I don't want to say viral, but micro viral, you know, like, it, like the first thing that poked out on my channel, a lot of people think it was the five things videos. That's where I came from. You know, like, oh, most of you are like, oh, I saw your five things video. And then they started following the channel. The video that really spoke to people, the video I did on accident that resonated where I learned why this would work, why you guys and I, this hangout thing works. I did a video saying why I bought three or four blues juniors. <laughs> And I talked about why I bought it and sold it and bought another one and sold that one and bought another one. And, and I just was being honest about the fact that I loved the amp, but then, you know, I didn't love it. So I got rid of it. And then I thought about it going, maybe it was a great amp. And then I got it again and I loved it. And I was like, what's wrong with me? Why did I get rid of this? And then I fell out of love with it. And then somebody, I think it was actually, <laughs> I think it was another YouTuber. I think it was, um, Robert Baker called it, a. uh, a dad amp or something. And I was like, what? Even though I'm a dad and I wear a dad hat, I was like, oh, I don't want no uncool dad amp. <laughs> so I got rid of it again. Not because of that, but I was like, ah, I wasn't using it. Yeah, it's just a dad rocker amp. Screw that. And then I thought back and I go, wait, but it was a really good amp. And for the money, it was good money for the amp. And each time I was costing myself more money. So uh, yeah, don't do that crap. <laughs> so that's why I said, if you're going to get rid of it, um, just put it away. I mean, if you're going to buy it, if you think you might buy it again at all in a little bit, uh, any, even a little bit, uh, put it away. Don't sell it. Um, Susan says, Hey, Phil, do you still have the olive green strap? I do. I have the, all, so, or, sorry, SG. I do. I have four SGs. I have this black one, which is the clone of the burst. I have a red SG with P nineties that I bought used. And I have the green SG, the green SG. So, you know, I purchased, which is the, uh, Chicago music exchange, uh, SG. I bought it cause I absolutely love the color. I, obviously I love it more than bl the black one. Okay, there's no question to me. <laughs> the green one is far superior, in my opinion, looking the black one. I just love the green one so much. Um, 
the problem is the green one is very cool, but it's not the same as my burst one. I don't know what it is. It doesn't feel the same. It's kind of like it. It sounds kind of like it. And I found it myself just always playing the burst one. And I said, okay, I got to keep going until I find one that's exactly like the burst one. I almost thought it was the dumbest thing ever. And then I bought this black one. I'd bought a couple others, tried it. And then I, the black one, I don't know, it just vibed right. And like I said, I think, I honestly believe this. If you were to give me the black one or the, uh, the burst one and, and blindfold me, I don't know if I'd be able to tell them a different, uh, they play different. The, the green one plays great and it sounds great, but it's just not, not the same. And that's not what I was going after. It's, normally, I don't want two guitars that are identical. That wouldn't make any sense. But in this case, I, I need, I needed, I feel I do, and I still, de still feel I need the same guitar duplicated for these two different rooms. So, okay. Yeah, uh, Susan says the burst sounds great on Phil's demos. Well, that was it. That's the you know, it's like it just I really like it. Um. Everybody's like, you want to sell the green one? I will eventually. I, you know, um, we're, we'll probably do some kind of sell thing. You know, I seen uh, Dave Freeman and those guys do that same thing. Same kind of logic. I'll give you guys notice. We'll put it all up, and you guys, not like a bidding thing. I won't do a bidding thing. You know, everything will be first come first up, serve. There's no like, you know, you, you know, pays the most. It's, I, you know, something like that. I don't know. I'll figure it out. Um. Okay. The uh, Grumpy My Guitar says, hey, for the Tone Jar, why not? See, I said it this week. It says, uh, thanks for the info on the Inya Nova. Uh, was considering buying one. Think I'll wait a while. Yeah, like I said, I would wait until the $80 thing goes away. You know, it, it should. And then, or just get the, you know, it's funny is the electric one, the one with the effects, it's kind of fun. But I, I actually like it without the effects <laughs> too. Like I said, uh, that was really tough in the video. I, I was like trying to show both sides of it. Me personally, I kind of wish. I don't know if I can say I wish I don't have the effects. I mean, there's there's a versatility to not having the effects because, like I said, it's more it's more takes more abuse because it doesn't have to worry about batteries and stuff. But um, uh, but if you're thinking about getting one, there is no extra charge on the acoustic one only the one that's one eighty nine. That's the one I would consider. One thing that's nice though is Amazon, if you know, it's just, it's Amazon. So if you get the, if you decide to buy the acoustic one, you don't like it, you can exchange it back and get the other one from Amazon. They're pretty, pretty reasonable for returns. Um, and, and, you know, and making you happy. Uh, Atten says, hey, Phil, Atten says, hey, Phil, uh, or he says, dear Phil, dear Phil, uh, what calls, what calls you to the bass over the guitar? Thanks. For the show, I look forward to it every week. I appreciate you saying that. Uh, what calls me to the bass? Well, nothing really called me to the bass. Um, uh, I became a bass player uh, the way everyone became uh, uh, comes a bass player. I've actually said this joke before. I got in trouble. So maybe I'll get in trouble. This will be twice. I'll get in trouble twice. Uh, I became a ba bass player. Same reason all bass players become bass players. They failed as a guitar player. <laughs> everyone becomes a bass player. When I say everyone, let's just say nine out of 10. Nine out of 10 players become bass players for one of two reasons. They either failed as a guitar player or no one needed a guitar player. That is actually probably in my case, both things happen. I was in a band playing guitar. Um, we were playing Battle of the Bands, uh, which was a big deal in our town in Tucson. Battle of the Bands was like a big uh, thing. It was all year long. Uh, like every band in town participated in it. You know, I think we got to the finals. I don't think we did. We got to the finals. And the band that beat us uh, in the finals, I actually loved them. I like that was one of those things. Like they beat us, and then and every, we, were, we were bummed. But I was also thinking, like, yep, they sh they should have won. <laughs> and uh, I don't know, you know, if it was a week or a month or whatever. I just remember going to Guitars Etc. in Tucson, Arizona, which is a store, a guitar store, and they had the remember they had the flyers. Right. And you have a little cut tabs and you pull a tab and phone number. And it had that cool thing that always says, like, looking for a guitar player, you know, must play part, have good gear, must be able to travel, no drugs. <laughs> right. It was always like four things. <laughs> right. It was either no drugs or must bring beer <laughs> or has good gear or always. I love it when they say no flakes. And I'm like, ah, oh, damn it. And it's like no drugs. And I got a good gear links so uh, anyways so it was one of those ads and it was for that band but it was for a bass player so i had to ha i had a crappy bass and i grabbed it went home grabbed it well no i 
pulled their number, went home, called them. They paged me. <laughs> I feel so old. They paged me. Uh, and then I called them back and they said, come audition. And I had a crappy bass and I owned the PA in my band. So I took the PA, uh, it was a PA mixer and a power amp, <laughs> a rack power amp. So I took the PA power amp and the mixer and two cabinets, PA cabinets, took it to these guys' house, stacked my two cabinets, put the uh, power amp on it and the thing and plugged my bass in. That was my bass amp. Uh, and then we, I played bass and uh, I got the audition and they auditioned and they said, yeah, you're in the band. And so then I took that stuff and some guitar stuff down to uh chicago music exchange i'm just telling this case like i said some of the people that watch the show are local and know the areas especially down tucson and stuff and i went to chicago music exchange and i traded it in to joe the owner and got a bass and a bass amp i got a, a gens Benz uh cabinet 410 and 215 cabinet <laughs> yep 410 and 215 and i got an ampeg SVP preamp and a 1600 watt power amp because that was my PA power amp. So I kept that. And that was my bass amp, which was ridiculous. <laughs> ridiculous. And uh, I started playing bass. And uh, that's how that became that way. And then at some point, I did what hopefully uh, you do as a musician. You go, oh, well, now that I'm a bass player, I probably should be good at it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I started taking lessons for bass and started improving in bass. And that's the way I went for years. I was a bass player for many years, for many, you know, for all the projects I was in. And, uh, you know, of course I started as a guitar player and I like guitar and I like collecting guitars over basses. I mean, basses are cool, but you know, I, I didn't grow up wanting in magazines, the basses, I grew up wanting the guitars. So that's what I, I pretended to collect. So even as a bass player, I was collecting guitars more so than basses for sure. And then uh, and then I just started a YouTube channel and I made a bunch of guitar videos and then, uh, everybody was watching them and was like, oh, cool. And, and Brian says, did he say 1600 Watts? Yeah, it was 1600 Watts at four ohms bridged and 800 Watts each, each side, which is what I ran. I ran two uh, cabinets at eight ohms each at 800 Watts a side. It was a good time. And so anyways, um, and then, uh, when I did the YouTube channel, I was like, oh, uh oh, I'm a guitar player, right? Uh, this is actually a, uh, interesting thing happened because uh i go oh i'll make a bass video because i better tell them i'm a bass player and then that that tanked <laughs> and i was like okay i think i'm a guitar player now on youtube and uh and uh funny story was uh, a couple years a couple years literally not even two years into this journey on youtube i met tyler larson from music is win and we were we, the first night we met and uh uh we were drinking a, a beer and talking and we mentioned uh he, he mentioned something that's funny. We mentioned that we didn't curse in our videos and that's what happened. Cause I curse, I'm a, normally I'm a cursor <laughs> and I don't curse in the videos. So it's like, once you do that, whatever you did, when you started your YouTube channel, whenever your YouTube channel takes off, whatever you're doing, that's what you do now. Right? Like, so I was playing guitar and not cursing. So on YouTube, I play guitar and I don't curse, but in real life, I play bass a little and guitar and I curse especially once I know you're going to be okay with it. I usually can't stop it. In fact, I, because of my YouTube channel, I'm always constantly apologizing to you guys when I meet you in public and you, so far hundred percent of you are always like, Oh, it's okay. <laughs> but I'll start S bombing, F bombing here and there. It's weird. Uh, but there you go. So that's how I ended up being a bass player. <laughs> and, uh, there. Okay. Um, what do we got? How are we doing on time? We're doing good on time. We got quite a Jeremy. Jeremy says, Hey, Phil, do you own or have you ever owned a birth your guitar? Mine's a 78 Greek Greco made in Japan. Super, super made in Japan. Oh, Greco super made in Japan. Super sound strat and burst original, excellent condition. But does that really count as a legit birth your guitar? Well, if it's built the year you were born, I did buy a year, uh, a birth year bass and, uh, uh, I bought a Fender P bass that was made the year I was born and I didn't keep it because it like doubled and tripled in value. And then I was like, Oh, I'm, I don't play it. And, uh, you know, I've, I've had this question before. I remember, uh, somebody asked me if you should buy a beer through, beer through your guitar. And I said, not really. <laughs> and, uh, I don't know if I still, I still think, here's what I think. I think it's sometimes unfair of me to say, you know, I did something and I got it out of my system. And then you guys ask and I go, don't do it. Cause 
now I have retrospect. Maybe you need to get out of your system too. What I will tell you is, I don't know what, I, I find like, it's already hard enough to find a great instrument. It seems like it should be so easy, right? It should be so easy. They make, especially now, they make so many great instruments that are great quality, great prices. It doesn't seem like it's making it easier. <laughs> It seems like it's weird. Like I said, what connects you to a guitar and to an amp? How many times have you, uh, how many times have you been in this situation where, you know, you buy an amp and you absolutely love it. You show it to your friends and they tell you it's horrible or you go to band practice and your bandmates are like, ugh, and you're like, it's amazing. And they're like, no. Right. Um, and same thing with guitars, you know, you, you're like, when do you play my guitar? It's going to blow you away. And they go, meh. And you're like, okay, you know, you don't get it. Right. It's, it's such a personal thing. So to me, it's already hard enough. Like I got to find a great guitar. I love, and then I got to find a guitar. That's the right weight. Cause I don't want it too heavy. And then now I got to find it the same year I was born or a specific year or stuff. It gets a little tricky to do that stuff. Um, I do, I, I will tell you this, what I do have that's more for some reason important to me for some stupid reason is I don't have a birth year guitar. I have a guitar. I have two guitars that were made the years my kids were born. Um, but I did not buy them for that. What happened was I just happened to have a guitar that is made those years. And then over time I'd go get rid of them and I go, Oh, but I kind of like having that. <laughs> right. Um, so maybe that's, you know, that's why I do it. But yeah, I, I don't really, I don't really find that to be the paramount thing in a, in a guitar that I own or a collection, a collector's piece, if it's a collector's piece or if it's a piece I'm using when most of my, my guitars, like I said, if my guitars were collectible toys. They are all out of package. In other words, I'm using them all. I don't have any case guitars, except for my gym doesn't get out of the case too much, but that has only to do with the fact that the price on that has skyrocketed so much to the point where I, I just, I'm, you know, I'm a little afraid of it, but I didn't buy it with the intention to treat it that way. It's just, it's turning that way. So, <laughs> um, the only thing, oh, on a side note, I should tell you this because this came up later uh, last time we talked about the subject. One thing we did, I learned from that discussion with you guys is that one really interesting thing to take away from buying a birth year guitar, and this is especially important for you young guitar players to consider. If you're young, like, I mean, young, young, right? Like, you know, 20, 16, whatever. Um, if you can do it, then do it. Then what, what I will tell you is this, the older you get, the more expensive your birth, your guitar gets. <laughs> so that's something to think about. Um, you know, if, you know, if you're, if you're born in 99, it's a lot easier to get a 99 guitar right now than it is to get a 69 guitar right now. So that's one thing I will suggest to you is that if you are thinking about getting a birth your guitar and you think you're not going to get it out of your system, I will tell you this, the more you wait, the more it's expensive that birth your guitar is going to get no matter what year that is. Okay. Uh, hold on a second. Okay. Uh, Ryan, Ryan's question is, Hey Phil, uh, it seems like new guitar prices have increased exponentially post COVID. Yep. Will they come back down? Nope. Or should I buy a new Gibson before it's too late? Look, new prices are pretty much cemented. They don't, they don't go down. They go on sale. So you'll find sales. The retailers have to take, look, this is kind of the suck part of it. The retailers, they have to take the brunt first. So when the manufacturers jack up the prices, they pay, I don't want to say pay the price. That's, they see the, the downfall of it the least at first. So what I mean by that is if, uh, you know, pick on I'm picking on Fender just because they're a big company, right? So Fender takes a guitar from $1,500 or let's say $600, $600 to $800, okay? Th then the market softens, which is what's happening now. Then you're not, you're not in the market. You're like, you're not a buyer at 800 bucks, right? You're just like, you know, you're just not in the mood. And, you know, you need the incentive to buy. And if right now there's no incentive for you to buy. And so the retailer has to, pay rent. They have to pay their employees. They have to, you know, make their, 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 their money. So they are the ones that will discount them first. They'll take the brunt of that. So they'll discount it to you and they'll lose, you know, the, the profit on that. Um, so the prices do come down in that you can get a deal. Uh, when I'm, 
what what will happen and that's that's phase one so let's say we're in phase one right now i think we're absolutely in phase one right now which means i believe that if you're looking for a guitar right now and you see it at a dealer i think if you talk to that dealer you will get a discount absolutely well i think that i mean i got discounts all through COVID. so do most of you because you were asking but i mean you'll get a, di a deeper discount or an easier discount easier meaning fast yes versus a slow you know slow yes right um so absolutely you could get a discount now in some time whether that's a month or a year then the manufacturers will have their phase of the problem which is the dealers are only so you know there's only so many people asking for the deals the dealers are only allowed to publicly because remember you gotta understand the problem is I, i've said this before when you ask for a deal one of the reasons you have to ask for deals the dealers are not allowed to tell you that they can give you a deal that's the irony of this business model that makes no sense and it's my opinion and i know some of you guys out there have a strong opinion against that opinion and that's fine you have whatever opinion you want i'll have whatever my opinion i want and we'll have a beer at the end of the day together we'll be friends i promise but the point is the dealers can't tell you that they can give you a discount they just can't so they're not going to publicly post it as an ad they're not going to do that stuff they're not allowed to so because of that you have to ask for the deal they are allowed to negotiate with you they are allowed i had a cut i had a viewer um we never talked about this on the podcast a viewer sent me an email i, I responded to him personally and we took care of it personally he said he talked to a dealer who said the dealer said that the manufacturer says they're not allowed to discount that is not only incorrect, that is illegal. Absolutely illegal. I don't care if you live in Europe or if in the US. The manufacturer does not get to tell the dealer what to do. Uh, I mean, they can try, right? A dealer can, like, if you have a store, like, I own a store. So let me tell you, like I said, I own the store. If I want to just take the guitars on the wall and start giving them away randomly to customers, I could do that. Like, I, I totally do. In fact, I did it kind of, right? Like, I would just do things whenever I, I do whatever I want totally can do whatever you want okay now that uh that being said the dealer can negotiate with you if they want to if they want to they don't have to but if they want to they can so we're in phase one right now definitely soft market means i'm sure a lot of dealers would appreciate the phone call or the email asking for a deal um you know i've told you guys this before look i don't i didn't want to discount merchandise when i was a store i had i had kids to feed and bills to pay however uh, I would rather lose a percentage of profit than no profit of all, right? Because I can't feed my kids with the guitars hanging on the wall in the store. It just wasn't possible. So they have to be sold. So a discount is better than nothing if we're in a market where that happens. And I think we're in that market now. So ask for the discounts again and maybe ask her a deeper one. Maybe go 15 versus 10 or whatever your comfort zone is or whatever you think you can negotiate. Just do that. But my point is... Um, uh, so the prices don't come down, but you can negotiate prices. The phase two point where I was talking about was the manufacturers, if the dealers don't negotiate enough, in other words, if they don't start moving the product, obviously if the dealers don't move the product, they can't order the product. And that's where the manufacturers start feeling it. Okay. They start feeling the, the lack of orders. That's when they come forward and start allowing dealers to discount. So they'll send out uh, emails or they'll physically send out reps of the companies that will say, it'll say, um, like you can break map map is the minimum advertised pricing for this period of weekend for maybe the, you know, president's day sale or something. Hey, break map on this, or they will just tell you we're lowering map. Good news. It's always good news. <laughs> good news. You know, the guitar you bought for 700 bucks and you're trying to sell for a thousand. We're adjusting the map to 850. You just lost half your profit, but at least you'll be able to publicly try to sell it. Have fun with that. Uh, and that's what they would do. And that's what they do now. Um, not all, again, I'm not indicting the entire industry. This is how a lot of it works. So, so um, that will be, you could wait for that to happen <laughs> to, to, to see if that happens. Um, and, uh, but eventually the reason why they don't lower prices only do sales is that even if they raise the prices and the market's soft and they're not selling, it's not likely it has happened though. Fender has done it. Fender has Fender in 2008 might be off by one year and it, it's between seven and nine, right? Obviously we know what years those were for the recession and stuff between seven, and nine Fender raised their prices almost 20, 20%, 20, 30%. Uh, 
And then immediately after, within like eight, nine months, had to lower them back down because obviously the market softened. Um, I don't see that happening likely with most manufacturers now. I think what they would do is they would do exactly what I said. They'd run more sales. They would come up with more incentives. They throw in swag. They do all kinds of reasons to sell stuff. They come up with reasons for you to buy. And then eventually the market catches up to the prices they've, they've pushed up. And that's what I think would happen. So to answer your question, should you wait till for the prices to come down? No, go get the guitar you want now and get the price you want for it now. Um, and if you want to know what I think you should ask for a discount, um, you know, look, ask for 20% if you want. I don't know if you'll get it. I always think you'll get 10. I always get 10 if I ask for 10. But ask for 15, right? Whatever you want to ask for. Like I said, all they can say is no. As long as you do it with tact and professionalism, which I knew you're the customer, so you shouldn't have to, but that's just, you remember you're dealing with people, treat people the way you want to be treated and, and, uh, and just ask for the price you want and see what happens. And when, and then if they can't meet your price, see what price they meet, you'll find something or buy used. Um, uh, I think it's Dwayne. Dwayne says, Hey, Dean pickups, what do you know? Think about them. I don't know much about them. Um, only thing I know of Dean pickups is that, you know, obviously I would imagine some Dean guitars probably have a Dean pickup in them, but I don't specifically know anything about them. I don't own any Dean pickups. Never really considered Dean as a pickup maker. I don't even know. I don't even know. I'm not, Dean is one of those brands where they just, they, I missed out. You got to understand, like, I've told you I have a Kramer curse. Now that I've talked about when I started playing guitar in 1989, in July of 89, uh, a lot of you, this will make sense. You got to understand companies like Kramer and Dean, they were kind of, they were kind of absent when I started, right? I mean, think about this. Dean and Kramer were like, like Beast Rich. Dean, Kramer, Beast Rich, those brands were huge, early, mid eighties, huge, massive brands. Okay. You know, every rock star you guys all love was playing them. By 89, you got to understand Ibanez in 87, Ibanez came and they were one of the dominant forces out there for that stuff. And, um, and then you got to understand on 89, you already have, I mean, think about this. Appetite for Destruction came out in 87. So you have to understand in 89, when I come in, you know, Gibson's back on the board. But remember, there was a time where they, everybody thought Gibson and Fender were going to go out of business, you know, trying to catch Kramer and those guys. And so, so there was brands like Beast Rich, Dean, and Kramer. When I went to stores, when I started playing guitar, those were not the brands you saw in stores. You, you saw remnants of of maybe BC Rich, may, you'd see remnants of those brands. In other words, maybe they'd be a little bit out there, but you'd mostly see uh, in 89, what you saw, and like I said, in, in the markets I lived, you saw a lot of PV, a lot of Fender, a lot of Gibson, a lot of uh, Ibanez, a lot of Jackson at that time, but not a whole lot of Jackson. I mean, even Jackson was not as huge as it was just a few years before that. Um, and then Brian saying Nirvana killed it. Well, Nirvana is like a year later after that. So imagine, like I said, that's why I have an affection for 80s guitars. I told you guys, when I went to the music store to do my first lesson, to you know get my first guitar and then get my first lesson, there was 80s guitars everywhere. And I walked in, I go, I'm going to get one of those once I'm a guitar player. And then within a year, those guitars were just gone. And then it was just like these other guitars that looked like the guitar I got originally, which I got a black, I mine was a JB player, but it was a black Strat copy. So everybody was playing what I started with. But when I started guitar, my friends were like, your guitar looks lame. You know? <laughs> so it was a weird, it was a weird transition. So um, Dean is in my blind spot. It's another one of those brands that I just, other than working on them over the years and stuff, it's not something as a, as a, as a player, I've, they, they've drawn me in because they didn't come back until like, I was probably was 30 when they came back. No, I had to be over 30. Think about that. I had to be over 30 when Dean comes back as a brand, really, you know, where you see it in, in, in guitar centers and stores again. So, uh, HK says, Hey, Phil, are there many combined delay and reverb pedals for an effects loop? Yeah, of course. Uh, do you have, uh, I think it's, oh, filters for the reverb section. Um, I use, let me just, let me just tell you what I use. I use the, uh, the NUX, New X Atlantic, Atlantic. Do I have it behind me? I do. Ah, it's connected. So right now in my Friedman is the new X Atlantic. Um, I have, uh, it's a delay and reverb in one. I use the Keeley Caverns delay and reverb in one. Those are the two I go to all the time. Um, there's things I like about both of them. So let me just tell you this. Uh, the Keeley Caverns, um, I actually like, so let me just put it this way. I like the delay and the reverb on the new X more than the Keeley Caverns. I like how crisp and 
articulate the delay on the new X sounds. I just, it appeals to me. It's more of a digital delay and I just like it. I think it sounds cleaner. It's less, you know, I'm not a big uh, analog delay fan as much. However, um, the new X, when I put it in the effects of my amps, which is how I use it um, for reverb delay, maybe because it's digital, I'm not sure. Maybe because it's an affordable $149 box, I'm not sure. It does a slight tone suck thing, um, which I really don't care <laughs> that it does that, right? I mean, it's I, I'm aware of it. It's again, a lot, like a lot of things in the music world to me. It's like, I'm just aware it happens and and you know, you, you, you know, you, sometimes, you know, you, sometimes you have to hit the, the back fender of the car to get it to start, you know, sometimes there's things you have to deal with. So it's a, a thing I just deal with. There's a little bit of a tone suck there. Um, not much, but a little bit. Um, and when I mean tone suck, I mean, it, it kind of makes certain things in the amp to me, to my ears sound a little brighter than when it's not engaged in the effects loop. The caverns has the opposite effect. I think it, it's more transparent and warms the amp a little bit, which I love but I don't love the reverb and delay in it as much as the new X. So that's why I have both. And that's why I switch between the two both. Um, and, um, and I told you I'm a creature of habit when I have, I actually have two uh, del <laughs> new X delays uh, and reverbs, the Atlantic. I have one in this room and I have one in my other room in my other amp. My other room only has the one amp. So I have one amp in there. Um, and like I said, the SG, but that's what I have in that and that new X, but the Keeley Caverns of the new X is what I recommend. There's a ton out there that people constantly recommend to me, but the problem I have is unless I'm reviewing it for you guys, um, you know, I own, uh, you know, I own these pedals and I like them. So, I mean, there's no reason for me to go out and buy another one. Um, but if one was to come through, that's what happens to me. Uh, stuff comes through sometimes on the channel and you go, yeah, I go to review it or go check it out. And the next thing you know, I'm like, Oh, I like this a little better than my thingy, you know, and you go, you go on your way. Um, but um, Grumpy Mike says, I have a hard time with $150 for the new X pedal. Really? I, I think that I always thought it was cheap. I actually didn't pay $150. I think I bought my second one new on Reverb. I think I want to say I, with tax, I paid $138. So again, you can find somebody to give you a discount. You know who carries it is Pedaly. Uh, if you go to Pedaly, they, you know, they've sometimes in the live chats. Um, and... You know, I never asked Pedaly this. Let me know. Let me see. Hold on. I'm looking at stuff. Let's see how close. Let's see if I can find their. Here it is. Okay. Um, so I'm just showing you this because, the, oh, look at that. Well, look at that. I swear this isn't staged. They're just uh, always super chat and support the channel. So I've, I just, when I bought my LPD 87, I bought it from them. Cause again, I, it's a reciprocal arrangement. In other words, I like to reciprocate. If somebody's nice to me, I like to be nice back. Um, I just open up their website and look 10% off. If you sign up to get a deal, here it is, but, uh, get 10% off. So, and I'm pretty sure they carry it. Right. Um, how are they doing this? Yeah. Let's see if they have it. Oh, they don't stock it. <laughs> so maybe, maybe they can stock it, but, um, uh, this is uh, an idea I've had uh, for a while, uh, and let me know if you're interested. I, I would definitely reach out to them for you guys if you want. Um, I've thought about reaching out to certain music stores and s seeing if they're interested in group buy-in. In other words, you know, like, hey, you give my viewers this discount, and we'll all agree to buy those type of products from them, especially products like this, pedals, cables, stuff like that. Uh, maybe we can find, you know, I I've tried, so, you know, I've tried uh, to to talk to the bigger uh, stores, you know, obviously all the big online stores you can imagine that I work with and no interest there. <laughs> right. Uh, and my experience is, is, you know, people, businesses do what they have to do. So if they don't have to give you a deal, they're not gonna. And so I'd like to find a, some independent stores that have a, an, a website. Cause I mean, you, you know, you're physically on the line with me. I need to send you somewhere, but I would love to work out some deal like KYG, you know, listeners get this discount when you go to them and, and maybe that will help you guys with that. Um, you know, like I said, I'd rather do that sometimes, you know, I always, I always have to push the affiliate links and I tell you guys all the times, please don't focus on those cause they pay me almost next to nothing. Literally, literally, I tell you all the time, please understand the affiliate links are hilarious to me because if you guys call and get discount, the discount is not double, it's three times, three and a half times 
You get you save three and a half times what they're gonna pay me. Please save that damn money. Put that in your pocket, right? Uh, you know, I'd rather you keep ten of your dollars than me make one of them. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, so so like I said, um, you know, I appreciate affiliate links. They are nice little ways to fund the channel, but please always put, especially when it's not the same. I'll tell you guys when it's the same. <laughs> Right. You know, um, if you guys can't save a penny, you know, you're going to pay full price. Uh, that's where I would tell you this. If you're not going to call them and get full price, you know, get a discount, you're going to pay full price. Well, then, yeah, maybe use my affiliate link and send me a buck. Right. But if it comes down to you getting 10 bucks in your pocket or me getting a buck, please put the 10 bucks in your pocket. Um, but uh, that's one thing I'd like to do with that. Uh, maybe work something out. So in other words, I'm, I'm hoping that by putting that out in the universe, <laughs> on this channel, maybe some stores will reach out to me and that are interested because that's what I've learned that, like I told you, they got to want it more, you know, so if they want it, they'll reach out to me. Um, I find that I've tried soliciting stores and what I found is, uh, you know, they're always like, yeah, go ahead. If you want to send your customers to, or your viewers to buy from us as customers, go ahead. And I'm like, that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for someone who's willing to give viewers a discount because I'm going to, you're going to get bulk sales from this deal. So there you go. Um, Joe Harvey says, does Sweetwater run sales? They do run sales, but keep in mind, you can ask them for deals. Um, and so, you know, Joe, this has come up so many times on the channel, uh, but I'll just keep hitting it home because it's important to know. Um, if you want to deal with Sweetwater, you just call your Sweetwater uh, rep sales engineer and you ask them for a discount and, uh, and they'll give it to you. Um, if they say they won't, well, then you get a different sales engineer. <laughs> and I'm telling you that only because I've had a bunch of you guys reach out and say, well, I've had... Thousands, I feel safe. Thousands of you have reached out to me and said, Hey, I called Sweetwater or I called American Music Supply or I called Guitar Center or whatever, Music Friend, and they gave me a deal. So that that absolutely works. But I've had a few of you reach out and say, Hey, I asked these companies for a deal like Sweetwater, and they told me no. Now there's gonna be some cases, like some products are hard, like Mesa Boogie, they're just not gonna give you deals, or maybe they don't have any stock to give you the deal on. That is sometimes the case. But a lot of times, if they're not giving you a deal, it's just because the person you're talking to doesn't want to do it. Um, or they don't, they're not you know, comfortable doing it or whatever their deal is. Either way, you can call somebody else and at, at the, just get another rep. <laughs> That's what I already know it works. Cause I've suggested that and you guys try and out reps and you'll email me back and you'll go, yep, I tried a different rep and I got it totally what I wanted. Um, like I said, look, you gotta understand the reason I tell you guys this is again, you know, kind of know your audience, right? I know this audience, you guys are me and I am you in the idea that we're all, apparently freaks. So, and I mean that in a loving way, like, you know, I, like I said, I refer to you guys as the geeky people. I'm the geeky stuff. People We're geeky. We're not buying, you know, a thing we're buying things all year round. And so that's the whole point, right? You know, trust me, retailers love to find people like us, <laughs> you know, um, you know, the odds are if you're buying a cable, you're not just buying one cable, you're going to buy many things. So like I said, so, um, you know, like I said, uh, getting deals is, is, is just part of it. Um, high mileage douchebag. Okay. This is the funniest thing I've got. The name is high mileage douchebag, but the comment is you're a good egg. Thank you for being you. That is the last comment you think you're going to get from high mileage douchebag. <laughs> I don't get to pre-read the questions. You know, I'm reading from left to right. When I read a name like High Mileage D-Bag, I'm like, this is going to go, I know where this is going. And then it says, you're a good egg. Thank you for being you. Uh, it's, uh, thank you for a compliment. <laughs> Usually what's funny is well, a lot of you guys, I can read your sign-ons, not, not so much on the live show, but sometimes on the live show, I can read your sign-ons in the videos, in the comments, and then you immediately go, I don't know how this is comment's going to go. <laughs> right? Like, it's almost like sometimes... The, the sign on is a precursor to what may come. <laughs> uh, um, anyways, thank you. Uh, Son of John says, Hey, Phil, can you help, help understand about back orders? I purchased the Yamaha Revstar on February 3rd. I've been told that it may come through one day, but it doesn't. Yeah, it, it's on a boat from overseas. So I'm not sure. Um, I mean, that's the pro the problem with the, the Yamaha Revstar is one, it's a really good guitar. Okay. So that's, there's two things. <laughs> there's two things that happen on YouTube that are important. 
First, there's the marketing blast, right? Like we've all seen it, right? They send every YouTuber on the planet this product and, and they all go out there and they say it's great. And some of that is, you know, just, you, you know, you guys are always like, ah, oh, it's corporate shills or whatever you're gonna say. And like I've said before, look, there's that. I'm not here to say that there's not that going on, but the majority of it is, who do you think these people are? They're, 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 they're you know, we're enthusiasts. So of course, man, like I said, we were like, oh, the new guitar, it's the, it's the greatest guitar is the new one. So there's gonna be a little hype is what I'm saying is the hype trail gets put out right away. Then sometimes it's not hype. The product is really good. The Yamaha is really good. And why is that important? Well, because if it's just the hype wagon, the hype wagon comes and goes. So everyone has one. And then there's piles of them used in every guitar center and every re a reverb auction. There's just tons of them because everybody got it and was like, yeah, I don't know if it was as great as they all said it was, you know, right? I guess they all got one for free, which is true, right? But I believe the, the Yamaha, and they might be having just, you know, supply chain issues, but I really think everyone I've, everyone I know who bought one that I know either personally or, you know, have some relationship with through this channel, that bought one still loves theirs. And so that, that keeps the hype wagon going along. And so that's, what's going to happen. And that's, you know, um, they're s selling out and they got to fit, fill those back orders. And you have to understand you, you put in an order. Uh, this is the way Sweetwater explained it to me. This is important to understand. Um, one thing you may be able, I don't, I never, I never thought to ask this. So if any of you get to ask this to your Sweetwater rep, Please let me know if they give you an answer to this. What I can, let me tell you what I know from Sweetwater. Um, a guitar, you buy a guitar and it's on back order. And then your brain is like, oh, they're getting a shipment on April 10th, but they're getting 100 of them. And I, I, I know this because I had this discussion with the, <laughs> with the Ox. Um, when the Ox came in, they got 100 of them, but they had 111 ordered already. So they came and went in a minute and then they were back order 10 again. Does that make sense? So if you were 101, you were order number 101, yeah, they came and to you, you're like, why aren't, why aren't they coming? Well, they are, you're just not, you're not, you're too deep down the list to get yours. So people are still getting them. That happens a lot. What I don't know, what maybe you guys can ask, cause I've never had a reason to ask them and I didn't think to, so I apologize for that is that maybe you can ask your rep, hey, could you tell me what place in line am I? And because that's another thing that they told me that happens in Sweetwater is they'll go, let's say, let's say they have a hundred ordered and they have 80 customers, so everything's good, and then only 70 show up. That happens a lot too, because the, the company, because so you know, one thing companies do, and this is a fact, so Sweetwater didn't tell me this, I just know this for a fact. Um, so companies try to disperse product equally across their, uh, distribution network. So in other words, let's say guitar center orders, hundred Sweetwater orders, hundred Bob's music, Nebraska orders, five Dave's music, Kentucky orders two. uh, you know, Phil's music in Arizona orders, uh, two. And when they get them, they get a hundred of them. Right. And so your brain says, okay, well they give them all to the Sweetwater cause that's the biggest dealer, right? That's not how they do it. They might send 30 to Sweetwater, 20 to guitar center, three to the Dave's music, one to Phil's music. You see what I'm saying? They distribute it that way too. And sometimes their projections are, you know, cause remember they're not only projecting how many they're going to get, but remember they don't know what the default rate's going to be. So a lot of times they, these companies, and, and again, stuff I've learned over the years, a company might order uh, a thousand pieces from China, Indonesia, you know, Korea, Vietnam, you name it. And then they get it here and they open it up and they go through it and they go, okay, th out of that, we're only, only 85% of this is good enough to ship the dealers. So we have to send the other stuff back. So they're now they're short on the orders. So that's all the stuff that could be happening to you. So, um, one thing I will tell you is two things you have to think about one, like I said, think maybe if you're dealing with a company like Sweetwater or something like that, you can think to ask them. The other thing too is don't think <laughs> that because you ordered from the biggest dealer, that's one thing that Sweetwater is not 100% accurate about. If you notice, Sweetwater will tell you like, we're, we have great relationships. This is, I'm almost reading in my head verbatim the thing they post all the time. 
we have great relationships with our manufacturers and we make sure we can get stuff ahead of everybody else. That's true because they are a big customer and they get to, they get to, you know, kind of like the manufacturers do have to kind of kiss the ring, so to speak with them because they're that big of a dealer. However, that being said, I have not seen very many issues or very many situations where what I said doesn't happen, which is they, they spread the product across their distribution network, no matter how big the dealers are. I mean, sure. The bigger dealers guarantee they get more of it, but they don't get all of it. That's for sure. Um, because otherwise what's going to happen is your dealer, big dealers would buy it all and then jack up the price and hold everybody ransom, so to speak, is a potential problem. So what I'm saying is, it is very possible. In fact, even likely that you could buy a Rev, a Yamaha Revstar in blue with the stripes from Sweetwater, be on back order for four months. And while you're on back order, 10 of them have been available on reverb through small dealers. And you could have just bought it straight from them and, and cancel your order with Sweetwater. So that's something you should think about as well, too. So, like I said, you don't, you know, you don't have to, uh, just because you're on hold waiting for an, an item, um, you're not obligated to buy it. You can cancel anytime, by the way. Um, so that's not, a, again, I'm not just giving you like, uh, go ahead, don't feel bad about it. I mean, literally, that is the policy as we water. You can cancel at any time. You're not stuck with it. So uh, while you're waiting for yours with a dealer, um, maybe it's a smart idea to put one on reserved, right? With a dealer like that you trust. And then while you're out there, go look for one and see if you can find one that gets in from a you know a local dealer or put one up fast. By the way, that happened to me during COVID. Um, Sweetwater could not get the Dave Friedman. <laughs> right? Uh, Robert, who owns half of Freeman Amps, Dave, I wanted a twin sister. Remember, they sent me one. I did a video and then they told me I couldn't keep it. And I mean, keep it, I mean, I couldn't buy it. Um, it had to go. I shipped it to uh, Brett Papa, who's a great YouTube channel. And, uh, you know, he got it next because they needed, you know, they want to circulate it. So you guys all got to see it. And I really, really wanted it. It's, it's an amazing amplifier. And I try to buy one everywhere and I try to get one from Sweetwater and I try to get one from everybody. And here's the irony of this. And I still kind of chuckle to this day. Like I literally took the advice I just gave you. I put one on order with Sweetwater and then I put one order, I think I'm a musician's friend, <laughs> right? And, and of course I'm taking the chance, you know, they could both come in the same day, tag my credit cards and I'm going to have to send one back, right? This is going to suck. But what's funny about this was while I was waiting for one to get in stock, some random dealer store. In fact, I wonder, I could probably just tell you, right? Let's see. Um, while I'm talking, let's see if I can multitask here. Uh, go to purchases. I'm going to look because I bought it on reverb. Um, let me, I'm just curious because it would be really cool if I can tell you who the retailer is because it was kind of funny. I can't find it. I feel horrible. Yep, I don't have it. So um, I will find it and tell you guys in the next show. So what happened was a dealer got it in stock, put it on reverb with a make offer button. I don't know what possessed me in a million years. I should have just hit buy it now. Instead, I sent them a make offer for 10% off and they just took the offer immediately. And it was only up for like two hours. And I was like, I can't believe you got one. And they're like, yeah, we can't either. <laughs> and then I didn't say anything, but I'm like, why did they take the deal? Like no one could, like no one could get one. And then I canceled my other water. So not only did I get an amp that everybody was waiting for, I got a discount on it. <laughs> Just kind of funny. Um, so like I said, there's, there's ways you can do that too. Um, Ranzir says, Hey, howdy from Israel. It is 2 AM here. Can't sleep. Well, I imagine you can't. It's 2 a.m. Uh, but at least I can finally thank you live for years of great content and fantastic advice. You rock. Man, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, 2 o'clock in the morning. That's crazy. Okay. Let's, let's, how are we doing on time? Let's, okay. So no more super chats, please. So I can button those up. And hold on a second. Okay. Let me do this. I got a question from Nathan, but he's, he says, okay, so here's what it is. I don't, he's asking me if I answered this question. What was this question? Oh, he wants to know. So what Nathan wants to know is have industry wages, 
have they gone up at the same rate as price increases? So it's an interesting question and I can't fully answer it because I mean, it's obviously I can't speak for an industry, right? Um, here is, here is what I can tell you. So at the core of this question, really what he's asking is, is he's asking, you know, we've all been feeling the, the inflation of the price of the, of the product, these amps, these guitars, these pedals, skyrocketing prices in some cases. And some companies, as I pointed out, in my opinion, have been higher with the increases than others for sure. Okay. And so the question is, Really, the core question of that is, as we've been, we have been paying more for product, especially product made in the USA, because I'm sure that's what he's really getting at, because um, is the wages that are making those products going up at the same rate? And the answer is no. Typically, I already know the answer is no for one. One, that's not how it works usually anywhere, right? Um, companies <laughs> companies uh, do a couple things that's funny. It's typical of any company, right? So when costs go up, the first thing companies usually do is they absorb them, okay? So let's, let's be fair. It's really common. So again, we're not speaking for all companies, but a majority of companies, if the price goes up, so let's say, let's use a perfect example, like a pedal. Let's just use a pedal, for example, okay? And I'm holding a boss pedal just for no reason, just for a prop. So you have a pedal and it sells for 150 bucks and the cost to make this pedal goes up 10% to them, okay? Which means that should reflect. So, and let's say their cost on this pedal is $75. Their, you know, end user is now gonna pay 150. Their cost goes up 750. So now we're talking about 83.50 for a pedal cost. And so exponentially now the price should all go up on this pedal equally as so, or, you know, right. So now it should be like, let's say $160. Well, what happens is most companies, what they do for two reasons. One, they don't know how temporary that price pricing adjustment can be. So they may not want to adjust up and then have, you know, worry about sales. Cause every time you raise a dollar, a penny, anything you raise in price, you're going to affect sales. Um, and, and I speak with this, uh, keep it understand. Look, we, when we launched the Badlands, I told you part of the Badlands thing is not just to have a guitar company, uh, that a bunch of us own and stuff. It's really, like I said, to share with the community, the things we learned doing this. And one of the things we knew exactly going in was, you know, 2599 changes how many guitars we sell versus 2499. We really wanted to knock it out of the park. Okay. We were, we, we were pretty strong in our market analysis. We knew regardless of what internet said, the internet said, well, the internet was wrong. The internet said, oh, 2499, these guys are going to sell a guitar. Well, we sold out all of them in 36 hours. Anyone with any business acumen will tell you that is not a huge success because if you sell that many guitars in that short a period of time, they weren't as high as prices as they probably should have been because the impulse buying on a high ticket item like that shouldn't be that high, which means that a lot of people were excited about it, but also means that people revered it as being a possible as a deal. This is all good, by the way. This isn't really to do anything other than explain things. Um, when we were calculating the price, twenty seven ninety nine is really where we should have been, um, based on what you know what we were paying versus what you guys have to pay. That's where we needed to be, maybe even twenty eight ninety nine. But we were like, we knew every penny over a certain price point, we were decreasing how many guitars can we sell. Okay, so twenty four ninety nine are our goal was obviously to sell anything, right? We saw one, we're like, okay, cool. Like I said, right. We just wanted to prove concept at this point. Can we make this guitar? Can it get out there? And, and, um, you know, and it, it, how successful can it be? Selling out wasn't really a huge thing for us. It wasn't the goal, huge part of the goal. Um, obviously it's better than not. <laughs> right. But we knew that at 24.99, it would have a more of a shock impact. Like, okay, this is a lot of money, but it's not at the level of, and like I said, now I can say this in hindsight at the time, it's hard to say anything like this, but it, now you can say it, look, you can't find that guitar for less than four grand. It doesn't exist. Um, a lot of people said, as people say all kinds of things on the internet, I'm just telling you guys, this is the truth. Some people are like, you know, 24.99 for that guitar. That's ridiculous. Find it for four grand and I, I, and I, and you can buy it. You won't be able to find it right? We already knew what companies were charging. Companies were charging double that and they were making you wait two years. So we came in at half and we did it in a quarter of the turnaround time. So that was kind of the market. Now, why am I telling you that? Because exactly what I'm trying to tell you right now, which is, um, I told you, we, we had a huge problem with our guitars, huge. 
which was the case that we had bought for $40 at wholesale was not sufficient, we felt, for quality of the, of the guitar. And we cannot afford to, to have a mistake. We can't afford to have you get a guitar that's broken. We can't afford it. Look, we only have 50 customers. We, got, we have to have 50 glowing reviews. Otherwise, we're dead in the water going future. So we had to upgrade cases. And the case that we upgraded to, we got a fantastic price on it. It was a once-in-a-lifetime uh, uh, opportunity because another guitar company helped us, a large, huge guitar company, helped us secure that deal on those cases. Um, but that case costs three times more. So if you're doing the math, that's 120 bucks. That's our cost, which is, by the way, I shouldn't say that because that's a $200 and something case. So, I mean, you know, we're, get, we're getting a smoking deal on it, but still going from 40 to 120, you can imagine we just added $80 to the price of the guitar. We had to eat that because we knew if we went 25, 49, that could mean seriously the difference of two more sold. It, regardless if we sold 10, five or 50, we know that as soon as you hear 26, right? 27, it changes your perception of what the deal is to you. So saying 2499, even though we know one penny more is $2,500, just saying 24 over saying 25, 24 over 26, it's a huge thing. So the reason I tell you that is same with the pedal guys. Uh, using them as an analogy. They did the same thing, right? The costs go up and they ate it. They kept the prices where they were. Most companies, legit companies, right? Not because they're good people, <laughs> right? Not because they, they don't want, they're charitable and they just want to help you guys out as customers. Um, that's not the motivation. The motivation is they got to move units and that those units um, are affected by increasing even a little bit. So then when you have to pass on that increase, now not only do you have to pass on the increase, you have to kind of figure out what you lost on that back end and add that in. So that increase feels really nasty at first. So here's, that's the explanation. A lot of you guys know this is business, business 101, but this is where it ties into Nathan's question about employees and their rates and how they get affected. In my experience in this industry, much less than any other industry, but in this industry, and watching how this industry treats everyone, <laughs> not just employees, but everyone. There are, for some reason, I want to call it the last thought. Employees sometimes become the last thought to a lot of companies. Um, it's who will take the most crap the longest. And that's what they rely on, right? So in other words, Nathan, the answer to your question is, they're kind of looking at it from a business point of view as the customer is going to take no crap, right? In other words, you raise the price, you change the terms, you decrease the quality. The customer is the first one to say, nope, not me. I'm out. Peace. And then you lose sales. In this analogy, your vendors are the second to say, you know, okay, we're not going to pay what you're, you're charging. Well, then I'm not sending you the stuff, right? They're the second ones to say, nope, not taking it. I'm out. Peace. Employees, unfortunately, especially the little guy, because they have lower leverage, because there's just not a lot of places for them to go. There is also, like I said, they needed the money the most, right? That's the luxury of having money is that you don't have to make any decisions based on any kind of desperation. And I mean this in the most kind words. I don't want to say the word desperate, but you understand what I'm saying, right? You you don't have to, you know, if you don't have to do something, you don't, you won't. But a lot of people, they feel like they have to and feel is an important part. They feel. So a lot of companies will use the employees as the punching bag of this economic decision because that's where you're going to get the furthest. Basically, like I said, the customer won't take it at all. The vendors are not likely going to take it, right? The advertisers aren't going to take it. Try to get the try to get the advertisers to take less. You know, like, hey, our prices went up on our product. Can you cut the rate on the advertising? And they're like, no, right? Especially in that market, because what you had was the pandemic was a unique problem. And that's why I want to talk about it always, because it's a unique situation. It was different than the recession we saw in 2007, 8, 9. This is different because while some people were experiencing a horrible recession, other people were having the biggest financial boom seen in a hundred years, if not longer, right? And so all those two things simultaneously happening creates a different problem and a different situation that we've never seen, which is, so you're torturing your employees by working them to death 
in horrible conditions and not giving them sufficient economic uh, uh, relief because the cost of goods are going up. You know, you're the price of eggs, the price of gas, everything's killing these workers. And yet these companies are literally looking at the situation as, okay, who's going to say no first and who's going to say no last. And some companies are smart. When I mean smart, I'm not saying good. Remember, I don't, I'm not equating intelligence with decency. They're smart enough to see that situation. And they took advantage of it. Some companies probably didn't even know they were doing it. They're just like, like a lot of people, right? You're like, if I tell the wife, no, she's going to get pissed, right? If I tell the kids, no, they just whine for a minute. Maybe I'll just tell the kids, no, right? Like people just do that, right? Oh, if I tell my boss, no, I'm going to have to hear about it for an hour. I might as well tell this other person, no, right? Like oh, if I, per, that's actually a better analogy, telling the boss, no, versus telling the wife, no, right? Or your husband, no, right? Like, you know, sometimes it's easier. Think about this. It's a horrible choice. We all make it. I've, I'm guilty. We're all guilty. Sometimes you choose your job over your own I don't know if I'm to say the F word, your own family, not family was the F word. I was going to say the F word. Uh, you chose your job over your family because it's easier to tell your family no than it is your boss. It's horrible. The people that love you the most, you treat them the worst because it's easier to treat them horrible than your boss. That's what age gives you, by the way, is hindsight to realize that you're doing that and knock it off. Hopefully you're smart enough when you're young enough to know that, to, to put your alliances in the right buckets. But my point on this is, is that although that's evil and wrong, I guess we'll say that right in this family versus boss analogy, you understand what I'm saying. Sometimes it's like, okay, I'm going to work the employees and I'm not going to pay them, but I'm definitely going to pick that over watching the customers not purchase stuff. So I think that's, what's going to happen. Uh, or that's what's happened. And I see that. So why I'm, why do I feel I can speak on this? Well, because obviously, like I told you, there's a reason why we launched the guitar company that we launched in January of 2023 and not January of 2022. You guys heard we've been working on this for a long time. Why didn't we launch it when? Well, because again, we, you know, it's, it's the opportunity, right? When the boom was happening, there wasn't a lot of, it was hard to get bridges. It was hard to get things, right? There was difficulties, but also too, it's look, you have to, you, it's like I said, with this, the, the, the economic of the wages, they're not kept, they, the opportunity for a lot of companies is they didn't have to pay their employees very well while they got to put the price hikes out. So that my answer to your question is no, the industry has not cut up in my opinion, has not cut up with wages. Um, and I've seen that in a bunch of companies that I've dealt with where they're, they're not up to date with the, um, the economy, but also to be fair, I think a lot of us understand, and a lot of you are out here, are out there, hardworking people out there know this. Um, a lot of you guys aren't caught up with the, the economy yet either, right? You know, the inflation is killing you. So, but there you go. That's my answer to that. <laughs> so, uh, Carl says it's too long. Well, isn't it all too long? We've been sitting here two, talking for two hours. So we're going to use Carl's advice and cut it at the, this point. Um, if I did miss a super chat besides Teledriver, just to say thank you to him. Uh, I will scoop it next week because, like I said, we went over the two-hour mark. We try to keep it at two hours so I don't lose a voice. Um, and as always, I want to thank you guys so much for hanging out. It was a good time. I hope it was a good time for everybody. It seems like we were more business-oriented the show than normal, but we kind of, you know, it's always shows go different. They go different every time. I never know what's gonna what's gonna happen. Um, <laughs> okay, I just got to say this last thing. Ones and zero goes. Wait, what? Huh? You started a guitar company? Yeah, we did, and we sold out. <laughs> in fact, we were just talking about that the other day. Uh, I have actual close friends that didn't even know we started a guitar company because we had sold out so fast that it was like, it was like whiplash. So on that note, I want to let you guys go. Uh, as always, I want to thank you so much for your time. You guys have a great weekend. Play guitar. I have some cool videos coming out this week, of course. Uh, and, and giveaways. We gave away the tuners last week. So we're going to give away tuners again next week. I think we're going to do it every other week is what I think we figured out. That way uh, we don't get backed up on owing anybody tuners or having any issues collecting up addresses and sending them out. Okay. On that note, guys, thank you so much for your time. Till the next time. Know your